Hello again, friends! <laughs> and you are our friends, even our laughing friends. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> the, uh, well, we hope you had a happy Thanksgiving. And here we are on the road to Holiday Mania. <laughs> I'm your host, the great Brian Lass. This is Jim Cornette's Drive Through. We have ratings and reviews and questions and who knows what else. It's the day before Thanksgiving. The kids have half a day. I think we may do half a day, too. <laughs> but here he is, the star of the show, Mr. Jim Cornette. Lowered expectations. Get them down there. So if we do exceed that low bar, the people will feel they got something extra for the money they didn't pay to listen. So there you go. Back at you, pal. And the reason why I laughed is because it immediately flashed on me as soon as you uttered the the first hello friends that you are starting to turn into art fern doing the tea time movie with hello friends and welcome i'm sorry well, it, it tickled me they are indeed my friends i'll leave out our friends next time you can well leave all the friends friendship. out you want hey i'm trendy mctrenderson I got all the friends and frenemies and everything, so I'll just, I'll leave you some, and you can have Art, Mr. Fern. Boy, everybody over 55 years old is fucking, is just holding their belly right now. You bring up trending. I want to think when exactly it was. I guess it was in the middle of recording the last episode, you started trending, and you've been trending since. I don't stop trending, baby. I don't stop trending. I don't stop trending. I, and I, I don't care at this point. It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous because they've taken the fun out of it because it used to be, at least for the people who followed the, the, the Twitter, you know, fondly, it used to be that was a big deal. But now I just every time I speak, I trend. Because not only do a large number of people agree with it, but a large number of people don't agree with it. And then they all fucking, and usually the, as we've found out, the large number of people that don't agree with it are all from the bunch of numbers family or have the anime accounts or whatever. But it then it just feeds on itself. If I actually came out here on one of these programs and said, I am in favor of feeding the starving children of the world, there would be people out there who go, fuck them! Fuck these kids! They've had enough to eat! Move to where the food is! They would just have to disagree with me because they are convinced that you can't possibly agree with Jim Cornette and be a decent human being. Why do those starving kids have to accept food from someone out of touch? Yeah! Why do they have to accept things from people who are dressed up like clowns with bright red hair. <laughs> that was just for you. <laughs> but anyway, so it, it's not really... It's howdy doody time. It's howdy doody time. I am, uh, I'm just wagging, I'm... <laughs> I am, boy, if we could only let y'all in on that. I'm just, I'm giving a, a tip of the hat and a wag of the finger at the same time with everything that I say because people have to be for it as well as again it. They can't, and they can't agree with each other because that would just be horrible. And then they, they'd open up a whole can of peas there. So we're just, we're trending all over the world. And it's trending all over the world on X, formerly Twitter. Now this is the day before Thanksgiving and we're on the turkey trail. And we're not going to take this very seriously today because this is the last thing. I don't know about you up there at Last Manor. You have various family members. I've got merely Stace and Harley here, so it's a small group. And we're going to do nothing but enjoy various foodstuffs from our new oven today after we get finished with this program. How about you? I mean, yeah, there's going to be a lot of family here and... uh the kitchen will be going and all the usual Thanksgiving stuff and the parade will be on TV for the kids in the morning. Oh, okay. I was, I thought you were going to say the parade will be here about three o'clock or whatever. <laughs> I thought you were doing a parade. Yes, that's right. It lands here midday. Yeah. And uh, for everyone in the family saying they can't wait to see me, <laughs> I don't understand why you don't understand. I'm going to be hiding in the office. I don't really want to hang out with everyone, but whatever. 
Boy, boy, I tell you what, people think that I'm the antisocial hermit. Hey, at least I stay in, in my house with just a select few people, but you have many people in your home and you still hide from them. Well, yeah. 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 I want to be left alone. I want to be alone. I want to be alone. <laughs> hey, <laughs> timeless Brian Last on the program oh, here today. Oh, James. I, uh, well, at least you don't have Luther buttling you. At, at least they found a use for him. He couldn't wrestle, but apparently he's he's wonderful at buttling. But anyway, as I mentioned the new uh, the new stove. We got the new stove and refrigerator. And I'm not going to go into a whole long dissertation about this, but uh, this is a helpful household hint for people who are thinking about purchasing uh, appliances like this. Don't just measure the place where it's going to go and determine that it fits. Measure the path it has to take to get there. Because we got this brand new refrigerator that Stace had picked out. And it's got a, a video screen on the front door. And you can watch TV, and you can watch YouTube, and you can watch the streaming, and you can get on the Twitter, and you can... You doesn't just got to call it a refrigerator. It's got a camera that shoots inside the fridge to show you what you've got, and if you turn the labels the right way, it will somehow mark it down for you when you're running out, and you can order it on the Instacart automatically. I, I was watching the rifleman in the kitchen last night on the refrigerator door. I've never seen shit like that. Mama Cornette would be, she'd be incensed that people spent their time. They could be curing cancer and feeding hungry children to fucking come up with a way to watch TV on the refrigerator, to be quite honest with you. But it, it's the goddamnest thing you've ever seen, right? And it's, it's huge and it's got, you can open one of the doors two different ways so you get the filtered water pitcher out and it makes two different kinds of ice and it's got the different settings and it's on the... Apparently, you can use your phone to call this thing and tell it to pour you a fucking drink. I don't know. But... You could text it a message or actually call I, it up and say something to it. I'm afraid to speak to it. I'm afraid it won't like me. And if we get off on the wrong foot, then my sprites will be hot. So fuck it. I'm just I'm just going to stay over here in the corner. And I, when I walk up to it, I, I, I knock first before I open it. I'm afraid, you know, I might disturb it. Yeah, you're, and then you're going to reach some scary future where the fridge starts telling you you've had too many sprites. Yeah. <laughs> no more sprites. Oh, boy. I'm... As it is, again, I knock, and I feel funny when I put my fingers in the slot on the door. It's like I'm I'm intruding on it. But so the guys, they come, and they bring the truck, and they're going to take the old refrigerator and put it out in the uh, in the garage because our friends from Versailles came and picked it up. They they wanted it for their garage or whatever. Junkyard. Um, they don't have a junkyard. There's, there's no such thing as junk in Versailles. It's where the polo ponies roam free. But anyway, the guy bringing the truck in, he, I said, you're going to put that one in the in the garage, and then the stove goes, and to bring it. And he looked at the old refrigerator, and he looked at the doorway in between the TV room and the kitchen, which doesn't have a door on it. It's just an archway. It used to, years ago, have a door. We took it off. But he's looking, he says, the new one is more big. I said, <laughs> I said, well, we, I measured here and it only sticks out two more inches this way and we can deal with it. He said, no. And he pointed at the archway and he pointed at the door to the garage and the TV. He said, the, the new one is more big because we got that one in there. He knew that much. So what they had to do was they had to bring this and it's giant squares well not square rectangular solid black it's immense it looks like a fucking tank they had to bring it in in this apparatus where they had these slings over their shoulders and it was up under the goddamn well have you seen these people now that carry things with this strap apparatus on their shoulders where they're walking with it without having to put their hands up under it have you seen this? Right, the strap, yeah. 
Oh, oh, the strap. Okay. Well, I've moved a few times. I've used it. Yeah. Well, back when I moved, we were lucky to have a truck. Used Why? to have to. My first two moves, we had horses to. But anyway, <laughs> so they carry this thing in. They have to open the front doors, both you know, like a DeLorean. And they have to go catty cornered in sideways and then turn and then turn it again. And there's and they're scratching the woodwork up there, but it's it's so tight. If this thing had been one half inch thicker, it would have not have gone in that fucking room. But finally we got it in there. And that started working right away. After I'd spent about two hours taking everything out of the old refrigerator and freezer and putting it in the freezer in the garage and the cube fridge in the office and a fucking ice chest and another styrofoam cooler and a fucking box and it put everything back in, the stove, the stove has a convection oven and it's got an air fryer. And it's got two ovens that turn into one big oven or two smaller ovens. And this is the goddamnedest thing you've ever seen. It does not have a TV screen on it. Apparently, they figure you can't watch TV while you're cooking with hot fucking boiling substances. That might be dangerous. But we've had it four days, and we're going to use it for the first time tonight. Because... They get they it, it, when we took the fucking shit out of the box, right? Here's the user's manual. Okay, so they all leave and everything. Boom, and I sit down. I'm looking at this thing, and it's 15 pages on what not to do, or you'll fuck the stove up, and or what not to do, or you'll fuck yourself up. And then it goes into the same shit in a different language. And how do you use this fucking thing? I don't know how to air fry. I've never had a convection oven. And so it says for the complete user's manual, download it from such and such and such and such. So obviously, then I turn that over to Stacy. And she gets her friend John that's coming to pick up the uh, refrigerator to print it out for us because he had time to do these things while well, I believe you and I were recording. Guess how many pages of fucking instruction manual was for the stove. Yes. 16 pages, 212. He printed that whole thing out. You had to, when you download it and print it right. And it came in fucking <laughs> five different languages. But the English, it's still like fucking 40 or 50 fucking pages. And I'm looking at this thing and trying to, so <clears throat> and then we, we wiped it out as per instructions and we ran it at 400 degrees for an hour as per instructions to burn off the, uh, the stench. And, and we've read the booklet enough to believe we used this, the, the stove top. The burners are pretty easy to figure out. But we haven't used it. We're going to try to convectify something tonight. Or potentially air fry it. And I've, I've never had good luck with figuring out how, to, how oven works. Or how ovens work, rather. Or English. That, or English, either one. Yes, that, that time I was so despondent. I tried to kill myself by putting my head in an electric oven. It didn't work. I just, I can't figure these things out. You seem surprisingly receptive to this new technology even though i mean this new technology on no. this you need these new appliances and you're yes accepting smart versions of them i will well i'm accepting them because stace wanted them and I, I about the refrigerator i said does it keep the food cold and she said yes i said okay and it's big yes okay that's all big and cold is all i want i'll never work this shit or try to work it but it's 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 nice that it's there. Now the air fryer and the and the convectioning, I'm thinking about making some confections in that convection. So I'm I'm gonna be playing with that over the holiday weekend. What's your thoughts in general on air frying? I don't know. I've never had anything goddamn air fried. That's the thing. They've been selling this stuff for years. How come there's not one restaurant? We have the best air fried chicken you could ever have. I've never heard you know, that. Yes, that would be because even if the air frying 
manufacturers of the air frying apparatuses were to open their own like chain of fast food air fried chicken to sell the fucking right air fryers right because if you don't have it i've had people say oh it's great and i've had people say eh but i've never experienced it and nobody sells it right. so something's going on outside of an infomercial i've never seen anyone enjoying it well, that's because all of the, the people that are apparently that are enjoying it are keeping them to themselves in their own homes and are not sharing with people and trying to feed the starving children air fried food. Well, this will be the big test. You'll be able to air fry your own stuff and give us the verdict if it's worthy or not. Well, I'm going to play with it because the thing is, from what I have seen of the goddamn of the instruction booklet with the stove, it tells you how to operate the air fryer, but it's not like, what are you putting in there? It's not like, do you prepare this in any particular way, or do you just stick some shit in there and hit air fry? I don't fucking know. I don't know what you're supposed to batter it, roll it, flour it, bundle it up, turn it yeah. sideways, and shove it up that oven's. I don't know. And I think ours has an option like super convection. I don't even know what that is. Super convection? Fuck, I think that means that they it not only prepares the, the food, but then it holds you down and fucking mainlines it into you, or potentially a, an anal probe of some description. Well, if that's bad chicken, that may be a bad experience, but Jim, speaking of bad experiences... Speaking of bad experiences, it's not my show, it's your show. That's right. This is a bad drive through And speaking of, I guess, big things playing with little things, this past week, Jim, we kind of talked about it before we got results. SmackDown was head-to-head -head with Collision and Rampage. Well, Collision followed by Rampage on TNT. We now have the ratings. Well, now, wait a minute. Actually, you, you misspoke again. I'll clarify you there. SmackDown was from 8 to 10, that was against Collision, and then Rampage was 10 right. to 11, and it was unobstructed by anything other than quality television programming on many of the other networks. Uh, but and then I another had... show, actually. Then a 30-minute AEW countdown was on following Good Rampage. Lord! My God, they're determined to kill the television industry. Um, and my prediction was, because it, it's an off night for Collision... SmackDown is the industry leader in the in terms of the numbers of viewers. I said this is going to be a fucking route, and I predicted that SmackDown would do approximately eight times the number of viewers that Collision did. And I speculated to you: Has there ever been a time in the Monday Night Wars, the Attitude Era, even TNA versus WWE for that brief period of time? that the the outlaw group got kicked by eight times their audience. And so now I do not know the answer to these questions because you haven't told me the numbers yet and I haven't looked. So we're going to find out what, if anything, that I predicted about this. Well, we're going to Friday night, November 17th. WWE SmackDown on Fox from 8 to 10 p.m. was watched by 2 million 206,000 viewers. On okay, average. Okay. On, average. on average. Yes. Upon the average. I'll give you the three AEW shows. AEW Collision on TNT was watched by 270,000 viewers on average. Oh! Which I believe is the new record low rating. Oh! Following Collision. Oh, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Or perhaps, <laughs> or perhaps following collision, AEW Rampage 10 p.m. was watched by 280,000 viewers. Oh my God! So Rampage actually beat Collision. 10,000 of the people that had been watching SmackDown said, "Okay, we we still want to see some more wrestling." What about that third bastard child? The 30-minute AEW Countdown special was watched by 139,000 viewers. Uh, and according, this is from WrestleNomics here, Collision's lowest total viewership ever, it was down 32% compared to last week's total viewership, which was 396,000 viewers. 
SmackDown was up 1% compared to last week. So, so, so we're basically, uh, they took absolutely no viewers away from SmackDown whatsoever, and SmackDown apparently clobbered them to the, you know, well, no, SmackDown was only up one for maybe it, people just said, fuck AEW. I'll just sit home in the dark rather than participate in this goddamn one-sided war. So what were the, do you have the quarters there? Where did Collision start and where did it end? Well, we have the numbers here, Jim. AEW Collision on TNT, November 17th, 2023. These were compiled by WrestleNomics. Quarter one, 8 to 8.15 p.m. Christian Cage live promo. Followed by Ricky Starks and Bill, 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 and Big Bill, <laughs> Bill, 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 and Bill, 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 backstage Bill, promo, Bill, Bill. followed by Miro versus Miro. Daniel Garcia, <sighs> 386,000 viewers. Jesus Christ. So they actually started with some kind of number for them. And they apparently have run these people off over the course of the night. Okay, okay, keep going. Keep going now. Quarter 2, 8.15 to 8.30 p.m. The continuation of Miro versus Daniel Garcia with picture in picture. Andrade El Idolo and CJ Perry backstage promo. And an ad break. 279,000 viewers. Oh, good Lord. Okay, so obviously, uh, it, what? I wish we had right in front of us what program was on first before uh, what their lead-in was. So, because apparently many of those people were were watching that program and just not quick enough on the draw. Go ahead. Quarter three, eight thirty to eight forty-five p.m. The boys versus the kings of the Black Throne. <laughs> Sky Blue video. Wait a minute. Is that the House of Black? Yes, but when they are on their own as a tag team, they are not the House of Black. They are the kings of the Black Throne. There are multiple kings, you see, of this throne. Oh, good. Well, <laughs> It's a multi-seat throne. <laughs> I think somebody came up this, with this idea while they were sitting on the throne. The throne is more like a bench, now that we think about it. <laughs> it's a bench. <it's> <laughs> <laughs> At least a love seat, if not a couch type of... Situation. Also, well, a couple big matches here. Also, Trent Beretta oh. versus Brian Cage. God damn it. Versus Penta El Zero Miedo. Oh, good God. Oh, it's one match with multiple people. Versus Commander. Oh, boy. Well, right there. They're up over 400,000 because old Commando. Was he going Commando that night? Well, that had picture in picture and also a full screen ad break where they give up on the match. <laughs> 273,000 viewers. Oh, well, they're holding steady right in the top of that septic tank. Quarter four, 8.45 to 9 p.m. The continuation of the septic tank match. Don Callis and Powerhouse Hobbs backstage promo. An ad break. Wardlow versus Evan Daniels. And the Evan Wait a Daniels. minute. He, he, make, he makes whiskey here in Kentucky. Oh, that's Evan Williams. I'm sorry. And the beginning of Roosh. Versus Dax Harwood. Oh, no, poor Dax. He, just, he was just tweeting out pictures of himself with his face beat up from the, the pay-per-view, and, uh, and Jesus Christ, he, he had floosh the night before. All right, go ahead. 266,000 viewers. All righty. Well, how about that big 9 o'clock hour to come in and save us all? The big 9 o'clock hour, 9 to 9, 15 p.m., quarter 5. Roosh versus Dax Harwood continued with picture in picture. And the big post match with Ricky Starks, Bill Bill, <laughs> Cash Wheeler, LFI, and Kings of the Black Bench. <laughs> 258,000 viewers. And they lost 8,000 at the top of the hour. And by the way, do you think Dax's record is still intact? That the only person he's ever defeated in AEW in a singles match is his partner, Cash? There's no way he beat Roosh. <sighs> well, let's go to the next one. Quarter six here, 9.15 to 9.30 p.m. 
an ad break. Action Andretti and Roderick Strong and the Kingdom oh. backstage angle. Oh, wait a minute. I got I got an update on that. We haven't heard about this and talked about it, and it's the goddamnest thing I ever saw. Roderick Strong had a match with Action Andretti that you just mentioned there on, on that collision program. And Roderick Strong had a collision as a result with the fucking mat. They've been doing the deal where Roddy's neck is hurt and Roddy's wearing a neck brace and he's got the Stooges, Taven and Bennett wheeling him around in a wheelchair, right? But when he when he has a match, he he hooks up and he ignores the bad neck and he takes the neck brace off and then he wrestles the match and puts it back on in front of everybody. So it's not even like the reveal the guy in the wheelchair can walk or whatever. And this fucking idiot action Andretti almost broke Roderick Strong's neck to the point... I, I, Hotchkiss Featherbottom showed me this clip because he, he came over the day after... Uh, well, not the day after it happened. Several days after it happened, he said, what the fuck was this about? And he had it on his phone. Somebody had tweeted it. He tried to do... Roddy's running at him, and his fucking little monkey moron with his gymnastics off the playground fucking play bars tries to grab Roddy and backflip with him over so they both backflip and land and he spiked him right on his fucking head and the referee's mouth threatened the people oh and apparently by sheer luck he was not paralyzed but yeah that was worse than anything you saw on the pay-per-view and we saw a lot of shit on the pay-per-view did the referee do a better job than Rick Knox did when Moxley got knocked out well, no, because the clip ended like three or four seconds after this. It was just a tweeted clip of this bump. So I don't know what... I assume because we have not heard that services are scheduled for Roddy, that's how I know he's okay. Because I would have bought anything. You know, after if, if you heard, yeah, Roddy will never walk again, I, I can see why. Well, those two had their big confrontation here in quarter six, followed by... Buddy Matthews versus Wheeler Yuta. Oh, boy. With picture-in-picture picture and a full-screen ad break. Are they going to drop below two hundred grand for this? 226,000 viewers. They're certainly on the way. All right, well, quarter 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. The continuation of Buddy versus Wheeler. And the post-match with Claudio Castagnoli, John Moxley... Uh, and that's it. That's all it says there. Oh, no, just Claudio. Oh, yeah. And then there's a separate John Moxley Orange Cassidy video. Oh, me. I'm sure there is. 241,000 viewers. Oh, they, they've they reversed the downward trend. And then we have finally quarter eight. And remember, there's another 90 minutes of wrestling after the show ends. Hikaru Shida and Chris Statlander versus Ruby Soho and Soraya with picture-in-picture -picture ads and an MJF backstage interview, 239,000 viewers. Ouch. They lost people for the MJF card. Well, they probably didn't know it was coming. Well, this is interesting, though. AEW Rampage, real quick. Quarter 1, 10 to 10, 15 p.m. Christian Cage versus Trent Beretta with picture-in-picture. 290,000 viewers. Jesus. Well, it's a regular time slot, though. I guess so. It's the regular time slot, so that's about what they usually do for Rampage these days, are right? Are they doing this low for Rampage? Actually, I don't know that. I think they are. Quarter two, the continuation of that match, an ad break, a Jericho promo, and then Emi Sakura versus Tony Storm with picture-in-picture -picture and full-screen ad break. 267,000 viewers. Quarter three, 1030 to 1045. Continuation of that match, the post-match, and then Eddie Kingston, Jay Lethal, Sanjay Dutt, Jeff Jarrett, backstage angle, an ad break, and the beginning of Roderick Strong versus Action Andretti with picture in picture, 277,000 viewers. And finally, quarter four, 1045 to 11 p.m., the continuation of Action Andretti versus Roderick Strong. And the, the near elimination of Roderick Strong. Apparently, so they did, they did a, a confrontation of some description on Collision, and this is the match where he almost killed him. The post-match with the Kingdom, 
a Jay White backstage interview, MJF Juice Robinson backstage angle, and then MJF Jay White, the Guns, and Samoa Joe live angle to close out the show, 287,000 viewers. So they were between 267 and 290 for the whole show, but that still was enough to beat the average of collision over two hours by 10,000 people. And it would have been... <laughs> Rampage would have kicked the shit out of Collision if it hadn't been for the 386,000 people in the quarter one that they were fed by whatever, and they lost then 107,000 in the first 15 minutes. Okay, for, for comparison's sake, in terms of audience retention, audience level, whatever, what was SmackDown quarter by quarter? Because we still got to do this math here, and I don't have my calculator in front of me, so you may be doing it. Well, Jim, WWE SmackDown on November 17th, quarter 1, 8 to 8, 15 p.m., the recap of the Damage Control Live promo and angle with Shotzi, Bianca, Charlotte, and then an ad break, 2,334,000 viewers. Okay, and uh, so uh, let's do some math right here. Where they started, because this is AEW's biggest number by over 100,000 people. What percentage of 2,334,000 is 386,000? I don't know. Well, I, you've got a computer in front of you. Well, you know on. how to use you it. Tell me to pull up that screen. Hold on one second. Oh, I didn't know you had to pull up screens. I thought you just typed this shit in. I used my goddamn Texas Instruments pocket calculator, but it's across the room. You know, I've had the same Texas Instruments pocket calculator for the past 40 years. Look, look here, never mind. While you were fiddle-fucking around over there, I, I, I reached my calculator. I've got it. Now, how do you figure that out on a calculator? Yeah. Yeah. That, well, tell me, and I'll do it right here. A, a Two million... 334,000, what percentage of 386,000 is that of that? How do, how do we do that? On a calculator? Yeah. I don't know. Well, God damn it, you're, you went to college and shit. I, didn't go, I went to community college for two years. Well, God damn, two years? They didn't teach you this. All right, wait a minute. How can we do this? What if we... Two, three, three, four... Oh, God damn it. Hold on a second. I said it'd be eight times, right? <laughs> Three, eight, six, zero, zero, zero times two, three. No, that wouldn't be it. It'd be times eight. Hold on a goddamn second. Three, eight, six, eight. I put too many aughts in it. Three, eight, six, aught, aught, aught times eight. Hold on, I got something. Give me the two numbers. That'd be three million people. What now? The, the what two would numbers. Be three million do... people. Well, yeah, I don't know. What? No, you just came up with a number out of nowhere. <laughs> no. I... Right, give me the numbers. Give me the numbers. The, the number is two million three hundred and thirty-four thousand for SmackDown. Okay. And 386,000 for AEW. That was their both their quarter ones. So what percentage of SmackDown's audience was AEW's audience? Or how many times, I guess, uh, was SmackDown's audience than AEW's audience? Well, that's a different question. It is 16.5% of the audience. So then it would be some somewhere around six times. the. Uh, but that's their biggest number. So let's see, time saying. Yeah, I don't know if quarter one is yeah. really reflective of anything else. Well, no, might. but I'm saying, okay, at the at their best, at, at AEW's best, I want you at your best. I want you ready to kill me and pull my eyeballs out. That's the way I'll always like to fight my opponents. I'm gonna give you time to train, work yeah. with your favorite coach. Be ready. I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach you how to beat me. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you how to get out of all my best holes. But anyway. At AEW's best, <laughs> it's the holidays, folks. It was, they were, God damn it, now I don't even want to say it. 
<laughs> SmackDown's audience in the opening quarter was six times what their audience was, is what I'm trying to say. What is the quarter two for SmackDown number? You have it in front of you, don't you? Or do I? No, oh, no. I didn't give it to you yet. Like quarter two, I, I don't remember where we are. 8.15, 8.30 p.m., the big 8.15 quarter hour. Continuation of Bel Air, Shotzi, Charlotte, Nick Aldis. Oh, Nick Aldis, I guess, got involved. Backstage angle. And also, by the way, AEW is getting beat up by a bunch of girls here. And then Pretty Deadly versus the Street Profits. Same thing! With an ad break. <laughs> 2,217,000 viewers. Okay, now, do the same thing. Two... What percentage of 200... Of two million, oh god damn, never mind. Hold on, I'm just gonna give me do quarter this. two. Give me the quarter two for AEW number 279,000. And that is 12% of the audience. I was about to say, if you times that times eight, which is what I was predictifying, you get 2.232 million, and there, SmackDown's at 2.217. So it's pretty goddamn close. They're already kicking their ass by eight times. My prediction comes true. What's quarter three? Quarter three, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m., the continuation of Pretty Deadly versus the Street Profits. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this show was up 1% this week. <laughs> the Bianca Belair, Mishin, I think that's um, Mia Yim. Mia Yim, backstage angle, an ad break, the Dama, Dama, the Damage, no, the Damage Control, Mission backstage angle. Is this an all women show? And then a recap of what I don't know, followed by Dragon Lee and Nick Aldis' backstage angle, followed by Dragon Lee versus Axiom through picture, <laughs> or through ad break, not picture of pictures, ad break, 2,243,000 viewers. Good God. Apparently, we are now proving that WWE could show Mighty Mouse reruns and get two million fucking people with this show, and they are blistering poor old Tony's Band of Merry Misfits, quarter four. Quarter four was a continuation, 8.45 to 9 p.m., of Dragon Lee versus Axiom, an ad break, and the beginning of the Santos Escobar Live promo, 2,165,000 viewers. Golly, I'm... I'm afraid that they're they're losing some steam here. They're only down to 2.1 million. Well, the big nine o'clock hour, nine to nine fifteen p.m. quarter five, the Santos Escobar LWO live angle, an ad break, and the start of Grayson Waller versus Cameron Grimes. Jesus, Mary and Joseph on a camel. Two million two hundred and forty-four thousand viewers. Wow, that gained eighty thousand people. Ah, Tony, Tony, how does it feel to know that they're wiping their ass with your television program with shit that would have bored the people to tears in a previous generation? Yeah, some of you guys are hot with your audience, but no one's as hot as Grayson Waller. <laughs> Let's continue. Quarter six, 9.15 to 9.30 p.m., the continuation of Grayson Waller versus Cameron Grimes. Bel Air, Zelina Vega continue... Uh, Continue. I don't know what. Continue. It's continuing into the ad break. Following damage control, Vega backstage angle, and the start of Paul Heyman LA Night Live promo, which eventually leads into a match. 2,277,000 viewers. Okay, wait a minute. Uh, what is the percentage, Brian, of two? million two hundred and seventy seven thousand versus two hundred and twenty six thousand that wow that's a ten point fourteen percent ten times the audience ten times they you could take the number of viewers that is watching AEW collision at that point off of the rating of Smackdown they'd still be over two million well, Jim, quarter seven, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m., an ad break, followed by L.A. Knight versus Jimmy Uso, which goes through an ad break, 
82,000 viewers. Ouch, they lost some there. And one would think not for the hottest guy in the company, but or one of the hottest guys in the company, but still that's uh, uh, 150,000-ish. That's uh, like 6%, 7% of this audience. So go ahead. And finally, quarter 8, 9.45 to 10 p.m., the post-match with Solo Sokoa and Cody Rhodes followed by an ad break, and Damage Control, Bianca Belair, Shotzi, Charlotte Flair, and Becky's live Oof. angle, 2,086,000 viewers. I wonder if something came on at 9.30, because uh, said the same amount of people were gone the last 30 minutes of the program. And that's hmm. against the usual trend. Uh, WrestleNomics has a trend line here. This, that goes, those last two quarters, against the usual trend, and we know they didn't go to yeah. AEW. Well, that's the thing I'm looking at. If it used to be in the Attitude Era days, they would pay attention to if one fell, did the other rise, and was it commensurate accordingly, whatever. And when AEW drops here, SmackDown doesn't pick up anything. <laughs> and as because AEW keeps dropping and SmackDown fluctuates back and forth, and everything's up until the last two uh, quarters, everything is up over. 2.1 million. But so I don't see any correlation between anybody leaving AEW or SmackDown necessarily and going to AEW, except the last two quarters of AEW was up 15,000 and then down 2,000. And that's the only time that SmackDown lost any appreciable people. So it's, it's negligible. But now, here's, okay, tell me what this is, these percentages you're doing. What percentage of 386,000 is 239,000? Uh, hold on one second there. I wasn't ready for that. What percentage of, you said 386? 386,000 is 239,000. 61.9%. So that means they lost 38% of their audience from where they started to where they finished. Correct? Approximately, yeah. Okay, so now what percentage of 2,334,000 is 2,086,000? 89.37%. They lost a little over 10% of their audience, and that is uncharacteristically large for SmackDown. I rest my case. Every Wednesday, they lose 20 or 25%, every once in a while, 30%. On these Saturday shows, a lot of times, it hasn't been that bad because it's so low to start out with. But in this case, they popped a number at the start, and they couldn't keep 30-something percent of them. So there you go. And one more observation. Do you think that the people at WBD, old, uh, old Zaslov or Saul Zance or whatever his name is, do you think they like having 14 quarter hours of their prime time schedule doing less than 300,000 viewers except for one? Well, that's how can, how two, can that be acceptable even today? It could be acceptable in one way. If the movie that they're going to have in place of AEW Collision, let's say on Saturday night's going to do a better number, how much is it going to cost? Will the cost be the same to TNT or Warner Brothers Discovery as another hour or two hours of AEW programming, which they get pretty cheap? They don't pay that much for AEW programming. But goddamn, how much are you paying to air? Terminator fucking 17 these days on cable. I couldn't tell you. Because that's w- one of the, the issues that that you, you found in when Vince first started convincing the TV stations that they should pay they should be paid to air the wrestling, right? <laughs> Instead of just airing it because it did huge ratings and they could sell all the commercial time. Part of that was <laughs> If you're making a deal where you're paying 
for the programming and you're not getting any viewers, you're not going to want to keep that up. It's only when the TV station or whatever or broadcast network entity is getting paid like an infomercial that they don't care when or if people watch it, right? We've gone through that with the syndicated wrestling shows. They would rather have a program that nobody watched that they were getting paid to run versus a fucking show that people watched that they had to put work in, except for prime time, except for the network stuff. And there's no way you can tell me that they want to keep tying up. What is it? 14 quarter hours is three and a half hours of their, any of their prime time schedule for programs that, have under 300,000 viewers consistently through the whole fucking night. That cannot be good. Especially, it, I would think you could air a rerun or you could air a movie or you could air a goddamn block of the Big Bang fucking theory and do numbers better than that and not be paying whatever they're paying Tony and whatever he wants them to give him a raise to for the fucking original programming that's not doing the same numbers as the reruns. Yeah, that was the one thing wrestling could always say. No matter what advertisers they got, they got the viewers. You knew if you put wrestling on your channel, it would have the most viewers of any other show on your channel, more than likely. Yeah. That may not be the case anymore on certain it channels. De it depends on the wrestling. Rather that you can't... It's like... <laughs> people won't go to just see, did you go to movie... Last night, they want to know what it is. And these days, apparently, they don't want to know what AEW is. He's brought it on himself. All right. Well, Jim, let's stay on the topic of modern-day WWE, and let's preview the Survivor Series, the big one, 2023 War Games, from the All-State Arena, Rosemont, Illinois. Well, now that's plural. War Games is 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 is. Because they're having more than one War Games on the same War Games show. Well, the name of it's... The 2023 Survivor Series with a semicolon, War Games. Oh, the semicolon makes everything all right. That's right, and we'll see if uh, the War Games are all right, but let's go to the lineup here. That's what I'm waiting to hear. What's the lineup there, Smithers? As announced uh, currently, in a singles match, Carlito versus oh, I Santos. Thought they, I thought they had a new wrestler named Carl something. Versus Santos Escobar. Well, this is heated up, uh, it escalated quite uh, seriously from recent television when we saw the the reveal that Escobar was going to fucking stab everybody in the back and go his own way. And it's probably going to be a pretty good match. And Carlito looks like Andre the Giant uh, since he's come back in, in this modern era. So uh, I don't... I don't know that they're going to leave the ring in flames, but there probably won't be anything wrong with it. For the Women's World Championship. Which one? The women's one. Well, they got two women's is is is. Uh, well, that's all it says here. The Women's World Championship. Well, remember, Rhea's got a belt. Who, who's in this one? The champion, Rhea Ripley. Well, there you go. Who's got the other belt? There's another women's champion. Well, not here. Versus Zoe Stark. Well, let's see what Zoe's got. Because uh, if she can't have a match with Rhea, she can't have a match. Um, she seemed like that when we've, honestly, the few times we've watched, a couple of the promos, she was kind of nervous or, you know, trepidatious. She just had been brought up not long before that. And, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be Rhea Ripley, so we're going to watch it and we'll see what Zoe's got. Whatever Zoe's got, Rio'll get. Well, we'll Whatever find Whatever Zoe's got, Rio will get. You make me hate music. For the Intercontinental Championship, the champion Gunther versus The Miz. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this one. Ah, uh, well... Uh, again, it, this is the female or the male. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Gunther. Not the fit. The male equivalent of Rhea and Zoe. I will watch for Gunther no matter what happens. And we will hope for the best that the Miz channels his inner Ricky Morton and sells his fucking ass off like he's going to the electric chair. 
in a women's war games match, <sighs> Bianca Belair, Charlotte Flair, Shotzi, and Becky Lynch versus Damage Control, comprised of Bailey, Asuka, EO Sky, and Kyrie Sane. You know, Bailey is going to be the odd woman out of this group before too long. They're teasing that already because Oscar and EO and the insane one, they've, they've got the previous history. They're all, they've all been friends. Something's going to go on. In the meantime, I've made my opinions clear. This is like having dinner before dinner or taking a shower before your shower. To have a war games match before the goddamn war games match is ridiculous, whether it's men or women. And it's especially ridiculous when it's women. Because how am I going to have sympathy for these goddamn alleged 250 pound tough ass, badass pro wrestlers when these 120 pound girls just survived the same thing with all of their appendages intact? So that's my thought on that. Well, in the men's war games match, Cody Rhodes, Seth Franklin Rollins, Jey Uso, Sami Zayn, and Randy Orton. Boom goes the dynamite. Versus the Judgment Day of Damian Priest, Finn Balor, Dirty Dominic Mysterio, and JD McDonough, along with Drew McIntyre. I think J.D. Funko is going to serve the J.J. Dillon uh, uh, part in, in this one. But again, not only do they have their biggest baby faces, but they brought Orton back. Another fucking star power fired, you know, a, a shot across the bow. And the Judgment Day is the hottest group. The, uh, Cody is the son of the man who invented war games, for fuck's sake. Why dull and dilute and diminish your goddamn main event of the one of the big pay-per-views traditionally by having the same kind of goddamn match with girls right in front of it? It's insane to me. But nevertheless, I'm looking forward to this. The baby faces better fucking win. I don't think there's anything else they can do. And thank you, JD, for doing the favor Unless uh, in a advance. Turn. Unless there's a turn. But who's going to turn that would make any sense in this? Randy Orton. They want to put Randy Orton into Judgment Day? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying yeah. put him in the group. I'm saying have Randy Orton say you brought me back, but Cody Rhodes, I still have a problem with you from 10 years ago. I think they ought to let the problem from 10 years ago develop slowly as they coexist and people can be reminded of all those problems before the, the actually problems become a problem. Now, Tony Khan would bring him in and have him stab everybody in the back, but... Do you think he should be a babyface or a heel? I think after a year and a half gone, let him be a babyface, because how can we miss you if you won't go away? He's a big fucking name, and especially the WWE audience, even if the, if the AEW audience thinks that goddamn Action Andretti is a better wrestler than Randy Orton, I'm sure they do, but... Let him enjoy him first and let the tensions bubble between him and Cody. And then you, and again, he's just coming back from a back injury. What kind of schedule is he going to be on? How long is he coming back for? Do they know that yet? Is it open-ended? Is he fine? Is he going to make, it depends on his condition, what his schedule is going to be. But I would, I would have him have the triumphant return. And then start telling the story rather than just, here he comes and it, it, he'll go through a war games match for 45 minutes and then stab the guy in the back at the end of it. Why did he go through all of that? I don't think they'll do that. Well, it's WWE Survivor Series from Chicago. Do you think we'll get CM Punk? Well, I, to me, they're, they're, they're leaving a lot of money on the table if they don't. But then when you think about this, What's $50 million to these people anymore? That's a goddamn sold show in Saudi Arabia in one night. If, you know, to have that moment to bring back another star, to backhand Tony again, to have another fucking, this whole show is promos. 
Goddamn it, to have Punk doing a promo once a week. It'd be better than having him wrestle. And you would get a, a, a another explosion of interest. But do they need it? They're not even they're not even trying. And they're fucking winning this. And that that's a you just gave me the entire pay-per-view. One, two, three, four, five matches. At the end of an AEW pay-per-view, you say, thank God that's over. At the end of a WWE pay-per-view, you say, is that all there is? But they're winning. So, you know, I'd do it, but I don't know that they need to do it. I don't know that they need to make, you know, that $50 million or whatever right now. Maybe they'll wait until they want to open up a fucking touring company in goddamn Antarctica, and they need an extra $100 million. Who knows? Well, Jim, let's talk a little bit about AEW, because we did not play any... Well, we played a little bit of media scrum audio, but we have some more, and there have actually been some requests from the listeners for you to address certain things. Oh, I wish you listeners would quit wanting me to address things, because it requires me to listen to Tony Khan's voice. Well, here is apparently Tony Khan explaining the Continental Classic, the upcoming tournament, which will <laughs> lead apparently to a new Triple Crown. Let's go to this. Wait a minute, there's a big tournament coming up? With you, it was a great show, and uh, I'd love to talk more about it, uh, and also would love to talk, in addition to Full Gear, about the AEW Continental Classic. Uh, that's something I'm very excited about, and... Uh, given the opportunity i'll gladly discuss we got a lot of really exciting things coming up it's been our biggest year ever uh in addition to the continental classic uh we've also got very exciting things like the aforementioned wembley on sale uh really excited about aw all in it's really just days away that we go on sale and it's a historic event for us and let me stop it right there it's weird this year of all years, saying like, oh, we've had the best year ever, the biggest year ever, whatever he said. When we all have eyes. You know, it's like, I know you want to put a positive spin on things. You never want to be the boss out there like, you know, we're fucked. What are we going to do? <laughs> you want to have a positive spin. I mean, you're the one putting yourself in front of the assembled wrestling press. But I don't know. It sounds we a little hollow like this year. Was that a Saturday Night Live sketch, or am I just seeing it in my mind that it should have been, where the guy comes out to give a fucking statement about a, a very important matter and just go, oh, shit, oh, God, I don't know what to do. And, but it was great. It was great. And the on sale of the show that we're going to have in 10 months is going to be great. Yeah, we have all these big things happening, and the biggest one's about to happen, the on sale for the event next year somewhere else. But let's go back to this and a really big swing to try something like that again and uh, build that kind of goodwill with our UK fans that we have. And uh, also really excited, speaking of uh, the Continental Classic, about AEW World's End, which is where the Continental Classic will culminate. And uh, we had an announcement earlier tonight about the Continental Classic uh, that I would love to address. Eddie Kingston no one's asked him any questions about any of this. I, I wish he'd just get to I would like to know more about the fucking Continental Classic if the Continental Classic would goddamn spit it out. Does he have too many? I mean, Dusty was the guy who popularized giving names to shows. Does Tony have too many names for too many things happening? Well, yeah, that's the problem is besides the name, the championships. This, whoever, I'll, I'll spoil it because I've heard... I don't know what particular titles they are, but the winner of this tournament, the Continental Classic, will be a triple champion. Three different titles are being... Everybody's got a belt. Everybody's got a belt, and, and only as we... When we did the list of them, we talked about it here on the program and went down, the viewers sent us the lists in of all the different champions... Only like a third of them are even AEW titles. The rest of them are AAA or Ring of Honor or Lucha Libre or goddamn New Japan or a belt a guy brought with him. And now he's talking about another tournament for more belts. Came to me, and as he said in his promo, and nobody could uh, say these things better than Eddie Kingston, uh, he 
was willing to put his money where his mouth is. He asked me about the Continental Classic, and uh, it has really piqued his interest. I think Eddie Kingston loves the Japanese style of wrestling and is a historian of pro wrestling, Japanese wrestling, and all wrestling, and uh, something that I share. And I talked about the great field, and we've announced great wrestlers already, uh, Brian Danielson, Mark Briscoe, Andrade El Idolo, and we have a great field coming together. And Eddie Kingston asked to me about joining what? and he asked him. He's not, he's been going for almost a couple to minutes do now. what? If, it, if you're going to talk about your upcoming tournament, explain it in concept and then talk about the participants. That's kind of the order of things. And the way you could convey the information to people who might not have seen, such as us, your fucking announcement. But he just meanders everywhere. And you he is not this is another reason why tony doesn't need to be the voice of the promotion he's not he's not a salesman he's not a promoter he's not a television personality but go ahead it's about it and of course uh we have a very different kind of tournament it's single elimination it's a very different format which is the owen hart foundation cup tournament and it's held uh in the summer it's a very different kind of tournament and we award a the Owen Hart Cup winner, a uh, trophy and a championship belt. In this case, with the Continental Classic and all the excitement about it, <laughs> it got a lot of buzz. Not just because people are excited about the round robin format, but people are, got excited when we announced the first competitor in the field is Brian Danielson coming back before anybody thought it was going to be possible. How many matches before he gets hurt? It's a round robin tournament. Well, How many matches before Danielson gets hurt? But also coming back before anybody thought was possible may not always be a good thing when you're coming back from injury after injury. Is he rushing him into this thing or does Danielson, oh, it's a Japanese tournament. I got to be a part of it. Is he coming back or, before he's cleared? Well, this, these are not things that Tony is saying, are they? Well, let's get back to people are really excited about this tournament. Once again, Tony wearing the Antonio Inoki scarf. <laughs> Looks ridiculous. Let's go to this. I think people got excited when we've announced that there'll be nobody allowed at ringside. We're going to completely shut down uh, any interference <laughs> by all means necessary. And these are going to be straight great wrestling matches uh, on the scoring. Let me stop it there. What do you think of that idea of having a tournament where you're guaranteed no outside interference? Well, he shot himself in the nuts again. Because all they do is outside interference and the cheap finishes and the fucking everybody beats everybody up in front of the referee, blah, blah, blah. But now he's basically said, but we can control that. We just won't do that. We won't let that happen. And so now any time that it's done in the future, you can't get any heat with it because the fans know, well, they could have prevented that. It's their own fault. So it, you can't. There is no logic to anything in his wrestling universe. It is a ripoff or an homage or a goddamn outright steal or prostitution of everything he's ever seen from watching wrestling videos from everywhere. And all of that shit didn't fit with each other either. I'm sorry. I'm on a soapbox here. Well, let's go back to uh, the soap man or the snowman, Mr. <laughs> Tony Cowan. Avery Snow. I have taken something that I have found is really effective in English football and really motivates people to go for the win and fight it out and uh, will create exciting possibilities in this form. There's no outside interference in English football? I wasn't aware of that. I thought people could hit the field as long as the referees didn't see it. Matt is a little bit different from what people have seen in other round-robin wrestling tournaments is three points for a win one point for a draw <laughs> and with three points for a win one point for a draw as you've seen in uh, european football and uh i think comparing it to what we've seen in other tournaments where two points for a win one points for a draw uh people will be really motivated uh to go after it to go and chase and uh oh people are really excited about the continental classic and when eddie kinks that's twice he said people are really excited about it. I haven't heard the actual people. 
who are excited about it. Well, but besides that, here, three points for a win, one point for a draw. Tony is going to sit down with his attention medicine, and he's going to book this thing, and boy, all these points and these totals, and it's going to be wild in his mind. And then several things are going to happen. Number one, somebody's going to get hurt through the course of the thing and, and throw his carefully constructed stuff into chaos. But secondly, can you imagine, Brian, even when you used to go to ECW shows, but can you imagine in any territory back in the day when you announced to the fans that there was going to be a tournament and they'd have to do math to keep up with what was going on? Yeah, that would have been rough. It would have been brutal. Go ahead. And came to me, something he said was, there's a lot of championships, a lot of trophies in wrestling. And Eddie Kingston, he called his life's work to unify the New Japan Strong Openweight Championship with the Ring of Honor World Championship. And it's a big <laughs> deal to me as the owner of Ring of Honor that the Ring of Honor World title is unified with the New Japan title. Uh, that really means something about the relationship between the companies and also... Uh, adds further credibility and prestige to the Ring of Honor World Championship. Now, uh, when Eddie asked me about this tournament, he said, I'm not uh, going into this uh, as the champion and you know, uh, reducing the credibility of these belts. If I go into this as the champion, whoever wins should be the New Japan Strong Openweight Champion. They should be the Ring of Honor World Champion. And of course, the winner of the Continental Classic. So uh, it creates something very interesting. Uh, Eddie Kingston's put his money where his mouth is, so Eddie Kingston's officially entered the field, but now... That's Tony's new favorite phrase, put your money where your mouth is. And, and I swear to also, if he would get to any fucking point, put a period on the end of a sentence, make a coherent, a positive fucking statement about to sell this thing rather than just meandering around about what Eddie Kingston's ideas are that we don't fully understand yet. Let's go back to this. I'm not sure if he's saying the tournament was Eddie's idea or just giving up the titles, but let's go. I don't know. I'm not sure. Now the winner of this tournament will be <laughs> not only the AEW Continental Classic winner, they will be the New Japan Strong Openweight Champion and the Ring of Honor World Champion to be the champion in three different companies, something uh, we've never seen here in America <laughs> and something very exciting. And, Didn't uh, Ultimo Dragon have like 10 different belts at one point when he was with WCW? He had a whole bunch, yeah. Yeah. Had uh, uh, s similar situations, I think, uh, but the New Japan Strong Openweight Championship uh, being defended here on American soil, it creates an interesting situation. Really, the only... Uh, Thing close to this was uh, when Kenny Omega had, of course, uh, unified championships. Even in that case, uh, it by the way, just for the record, I mean, we've broken it up a few times. He's been going five minutes so far, not one question. He's yeah, just and, answering his own question for five minutes so far. But all, but, and he hadn't answered it yet. No, the question he didn't ask. And another thing, it's so important to him: the New Japan Strong Open Weight and the Ring of Honor, and this, it's fucking word salad and letter fucking Cheerios to most of the people that he might be trying to appeal to with a good quality program about AEW. He's got to fucking have all these titles in his fingers and all these companies because he's a mark. He's a basement mark. It's the worst kind. It's just meaningless titles, meaningless dream matches with meaningless interpromotional fucks that he enjoys and doesn't know that it's going to be abysmal when he puts them all together. This is why that the WWE, with the most boring programming in the history of wrestling, is drawing ten times his television audience. Because he's nerded this thing out to the point where even the goddamn... I bet half these newsletter writers are like, God damn, he's really going for the deep cuts. It's just insane. Well, let's go back to the basement. Here's Tony Khan. It, it was an international title he held. So to hold uh, championships of three different promotions here in uh, one country, it's pretty historic for whoever wins the AEW Continental Classic. It was really gutsy of Eddie to put up his uh, titles to enter the tournament, but I think it speaks to the kind of champion he is, but also now we know uh, whoever wins this tournament is going to come away with a very, very prestigious title. And it's actually not 
just creating more championships in wrestling. It's actually consolidation, but more important is cooperation <laughs> because what this triple crown means that the winner of this tournament, which is going to be a great field uh, that we're going to be announcing in the coming days as we approach Wednesday the night. The field Dynamite that Tony is standing out in the middle of. That's what the field is. And, uh, and yes, this is a this is a tournament where the winner is going to end up being the champion of the tournament, the Continental Classic. Well, imagine that. Every tournament winner is the champion of the tournament, but it's not a fucking title. Uh, they're also going to have a world title from a secondary company that I own and put on YouTube. And they're also going to have a secondary title from a Japanese company who's trying to promote in America and puts their strong, open weight belt on people that fucking live here so they don't have to fly them. What the fuck is this? It's Nobody knows these things except this small minority of even the AEW audience that are apparently able to keep up with this stuff, this minute minutia of everything going on in these small or barely existing promotions or ones around the world. And that's why he's not paying any attention to the shit that AEW is in. And it's going to be a big test, too, for all the fans that for all these years said, oh, I wish there were one of these champion carnival-type tournaments here in the States or G1. Now we're going to see how it really goes on TV and if the general fan is interested in it. And this point system, which is better because it's three points, not two points. Let's go back to Tony. Maybe he'll answer it. It's going to be creating a championship that's very prestigious and a champion that represents three different companies on American soil and three different companies worldwide. So I'm really excited about that. And uh, now I can start taking questions, uh, but just wanted to kind of give you guys a little bit more information about the Continental Classic. Does he enjoy too much the idea of playing the role of promoter? I don't just mean by like he's a rich kid promoting, but he's talking in kayfabe. You know, this conversation, I had a conversation with Eddie and he said, I need the best, whatever he just talked about. Yeah, yeah. He's talking in kayfabe. He's trying to get the story over in kayfabe. Does he enjoy this too much? He just, he just yes. for six minutes, by the way. Well, he's out there for two hours, whether it's the talent talking or not, he's sitting right next to him so he can smile and nod. He enjoys the attention because this is his dream to have done this. We've gone over this many times. He loves talking to the fans. He loves talking to the reporters. He loves telling them about all the great things that his live action figures are going to be doing. And all of the minute championships and all this fucking intricate stuff that in his mind all fits together perfectly. And he gets an opportunity to play with all these other different rich kids that own their sets of live action figures around the world. And it's this is why that he is appealing to a smaller and smaller group of people because as they get farther into the we nerd weeds and farther into the ridiculousness of the whole idea of the meaningless matches, the multiple titles, the constant tournaments, the multiple man bullshit, as well as the injury rate that he's got because these guys are marks for their own shit. And there's nobody to tell him no. This is what's happening. And they can't deny it. They're, they're in 22,000 seat buildings with 2,200 fucking people. They're not only filling a tenth of the building, they're getting drubbed by 10 times in TV ratings. And he can't figure it out yet. This is bad indie wrestling on national television with mostly bad indie wrestlers doing it. And it don't fly. Well, let's go back to Mr. Fly, Tony Khan. We do. We have to? Yes. The winner of the tournament will be the Ring of Honor World Champion. They will be, and New Japan has cleared this, that Eddie is their champion. And New Japan is aware and that the winner of the AEW Continental Classic will be the New Japan Strong Openweight Champion. They'll be the Ring of Honor World Champion, and they will be the AEW Continental Champion. So we are unifying all three titles. No, it will be a triple crown. And forming a triple crown of uh, three titles 
It'll be the Ring of Honor World Title, the New Japan Strong Openweight <laughs> Title, and this tournament. And what's really great is uh, I think we found something here. There's a lot of excitement about the Continental Classic, so uh, it creates a, a venue. No so excitement. what I'm excited about is that the winner of this tournament will go out and defend the championships throughout the year, and whoever at this time next year is the champion will have another huge field to participate in. And we have a lot of excitement about uh, this and people clamoring to enter. And in the coming clamor, days, clamor, I believe clamor, you'll clamor. see a lot of the most exciting young stars and some of the top stars in AEW all are lining up for this opportunity. And uh, it is an exciting opportunity because uh, people ask what the Continental Classic, what does it represent? Well, it represents something very important, a competition in AEW against uh, other top stars, but also something more prestigious because for the champion of two other companies to step in and say, I want to be in this competition. And uh, if I'm in this competition and I don't win it, then whoever wins wait, wait, should wait. be. Wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. The champion of two other companies, that doesn't even make sense. Ring of Honor is a company he owns, right? And well, yeah. Eddie Kingston is under contract to AEW, even though he also is the New Japan Strong Openweight Champion, which is, again, a secondary title in New Japan. And the Continental Champion is a championship that they're making up with it. So there's nobody in any different companies that is going to be represented here. And besides that, now they're going to have a Continental title, and they've already got an international title. Does that mean if they were to unify those, it would be the Intercontinental title? That's a good question. A former All-Atlantic Championship is the uh, International Championship. Yes, because they figured out that they misfigured where the Atlantic Ocean was, and a lot of people got lost. If it is the Continental Championship, does that mean it doesn't leave the continent? I think that's that's correct, right? Either that or, you know, it can only be defended on one continent. What if you're the size of a continent, like a big fat guy? Well, in that case, then you ought to be able to, to either be continental or incontinent, depending on which one you so choose. All right, well, let's go back to Mr. Incontinent, Tony Khan. The champion of the companies I'm the champion of, and in this case, uh, the winner of this will unify uh, three different promotions championships, which has been a novel idea when uh, we've seen it before, and frankly, uh, has been a novel interest, idea course, when we've seen it before. It's deja vu all over again. <laughs> collected belts, and at one point, I think, had built a, a very impressive collection of championship belts of different promotions. And uh, in All Japan Pro Wrestling, you have different championship belts. Uh, the PWF <laughs> and uh, uh, the NWA United National and different promotions. Does it, I'm just so I named two of them. Does anybody know what the third belt in the All Japan Triple Crown is? Besides maybe Jim, and even if, or does even Jim? Jim, can you tell me? Oh, is he talking to me? He's talking to are you. you. Are you talking to me? He's talking to you, Jim. It actually it was the PWF title, right? Right. And he just mentioned that. And the, what was the other one? You know, it was the All Asian. And then was it the international? Hold on, now I have to look it up. Although I guess he's about to say it, but all... I don't know, he was reaching for those first two. The All Japan Triple Crown Championship is a combination of the PWF World Heavyweight Championship, the NWA, yeah, I was right, the International Heavyweight Championship, and the NWA United National Championship. United National title, that's what it was. Let's go back to uh, <sighs> Tony, Antonio Kanoki, as you put it the other day. You him know the third belt in the All Japan? Okay. Then, uh, so, 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 you get, so again, like the All Japan Triple Crown, I feel like it's been around for so long that people, and I'm in a room full of wrestling media, and uh, that does to some point, I think the identity of the Triple Crown consumed each of the individual titles. Please. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the international. So there. I don't know what's going on. Let's we got to somehow get to another question. He's been well, I, I, no, we don't need to get to another question. Well, I, but here's the thing also that I'm afraid, Tony, since he wasn't alive at that point, he studied all these things through tape and the Internet. 
The PWF title was the Pacific Wrestling Federation. That was Baba's the version of the NWA or WCW or the governing body, right, for many years. The United National title had been established, and I can't remember the entire roots of it, but for a number of years, and did that did that title even come from another promotion that they absorbed at one point or absorbed the champion, like the IWE when they got Rusher Kimura? Uh, and then the all of those championships, the NWA International title had been defended and been around since the 60s, I believe, had it not, on an ongoing but not every week basis. The titles were established. They'd had many different stars hold them, and there'd been many different defenses before they got the idea to put them to, up for grabs in the Champion Carnival Tournament, right? You're the Japanese expert. I don't remember if it was up in the Champions Carnival Tournament. Or wh however, time, the however they unified it. They unified it originally that way, yeah. Yes. So, point being, he's got one his secondary company's title, a, a Japanese company's secondary title, and one, a new one that they're making from scratch to give to the winner of this tournament. It's not the same thing as having like 15 or 20 years of history of all this shit and then uniting it. He's missing the points of these things. Some of these things are great things to do, but not in the time or place or context that he does them or with the people he does them with. It's He's doing everything. What do the kids call it? Spamming? When you just hold your finger down on the goddamn button or whatever? He's just holding his finger on a fucking button. And he's pushing all my buttons today. Well, one more little bit of audio, because Jason included this. Apparently, this is in the middle of Tony giving an answer about what he would want to do differently in 2024 and better in 2024 for AEW. Ever done, and I felt like we did. We had some incredible matches that were on a level beyond anything we've ever done when we come to L.A., and that was my goal, to like set a new bar here, and we did. And we had the Texas death match, which to me was one of the most incredible matches <sighs> ever in AEW. And, I, and I'm biased, but I thought it was one of the greatest matches I've ever seen. And, and then uh, that is the ultimate high bar. And going into that, there'd already been so much great stuff on the card. And Orange Cassidy was here. I thought Orange Cassidy uh, <laughs> was just incredible in the John Moxley match. Those guys tore the house down and... Uh, Julia Hart was here. I thought Julia Hart, Chris Statlander, and Sky Blue was a great match. The latter match, those guys were in here. They were great. And then the every match was great. It was great. We were all great. And by the Final way, the, the show, fact that uh, hold on, the oh, fact sorry. the fact that this fucking guy, he's the boss, and he thought that Texas Death Match was just one of the greatest things he's ever seen. That's why they're fucked. That's why they've been fucked since the start, and that's why I knew the first time I spoke to Mr. Tony that this was going to be a goddamn fiasco because of that kind of Mark viewpoint. Young Bucks and Jericho and Omega were able to really uh, keep the crowd going after they'd seen so much stuff in the Texas death match. But then at the end of the show, knowing that the crowd has seen so much, it was a testament, I thought, to MJF and Jay White and how much people wanted to see where the story turned, that the crowd was really on the edge of their seat for the entire last match. And it was different. And I think if people want to see the sports-based presentation in every match, there's 33 <laughs> matches in the Continental Classic. So get ready, strap in. Get ready. Every Wednesday and Saturday, the same people who don't want to see any outside interference. Wait, did he say I'm there's 33 fucking matches in the tournament? Did he say 33 matches or 33 competitors? I think he said 33 matches. Hold on, I'll go back a little bit. Let's hear it again. Presentation in every match, there's 33 matches in the Continental Classic. So get ready, strap in. Get ready. Every Wednesday and Saturday, the same people who don't want to see any outside interference. I'm not bullshitting. I'm dead serious. If you don't want to see any outside interference, if you want to see straight wrestling at its very best in a great field, uh, then put your money where your fucking mouth is. And Wednesdays and Saturdays, I expect to see you uh, strapped in because <laughs> wow. we are going to put on the best wrestling tournament with some of the best matches. And the problem is he still doesn't understand the problem is him. And it's always going to be him. And he loves doing this. He's not great at it. And 
He's thinking like a fringe fan. I could say that as a longtime fringe fan. He's thinking like a fringe fan. I no, <sighs> Brian, if you're the fringe, then he's out past Pluto. Because uh, you know better than he does what the fuck is going on here. Apparently, most people do, but they can't tell him. Well, we have 33 matches uh, on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Is that going to... Okay, is that going to be just all of the TV show is going to be these tournament matches? Or are they going to have tournament matches and other regular television content? So... So they're going to have to tell the story that now this is a tournament match, so nobody can interfere. But the next match is just one of our regular fucked up matches, so people are going to come down and fuck goats in front of your very eyes and interfere at their heart's content. That is going to be interesting. How do they go from one segment to the next if one is just pure purity, I guess? Not even because, pure anything. Yes, purity. When, <laughs> when has there not been interference in any goddamn AEW television match that wasn't a complete squash? Ever. Even the Texas death match had interfered. Yes. So now they're going to go, okay, now remember this is a tournament match, so we have padlocked the locker rooms. It's not possible for anybody to come down and interfere. How's that going to work? The bigger question is, what is sports-based wrestling, and what is a sports-based presentation? And this is something we were teased with in the early days of AEW, and it's something a lot of fans like me wanted. My idea of sports-based wrestling isn't Here's two competitors. They're both in black trunks. They're now going to grapple, and the best man will win, and then they're going to shake hands. My idea is Mid-South Wrestling, where you don't talk down to your audience, and no matter what happens, you put it in a reasonable context so it makes sense. You don't talk it's, down to your audience. There's no condescending. If, if something, if you have a great idea, but it can't possibly really happen, don't fucking do it. And, and make your fans believe in, in the personalities of your talent roster, whether positive or negative, so that they will have a strong vested interest in seeing who wins and what's going to go on. And make the work look good so it doesn't look like phony bullshit or like children fucking performing it. That's sports-based presentation. Does he think that Swerve and Dipshit was sports-based when they were not only using obviously fake props, but cooperating with each other to do stupid shit that nobody would ever do in real life? Well, I think that's one of the things for sports-based wrestling that fans who want it want is nothing that is ridiculous. Just make everything reasonable. Everything has to make sense. Not say, I want angles. I want promos. I want good heels. I don't just want these guys are going to go in there and work their wrist for 20 minutes. That doesn't appeal to me. There is something in between. It's not just, we're going to give them Swerve Hangman, or we're going to give them, you know, we were you and Daniel Garcia out there grappling with each other. There's or the, or then, and, and, and keep, the, keep the guys off the trampoline. The, it's either cheerleading routines, garbage blood wrestling, or, you know, completely ridiculous, preposterous comedy scenarios. None of that is sports-based presentation of pro wrestling. Maybe the uneven parallel bars, but not pro wrestling. But, but did he ever know to begin with what that meant when he was saying it? Or is this what he thought it meant? I don't know, because again, Cody was saying it early on. And I think Cody had, even though it wasn't perfect, Cody's idea of sports-based wrestling was probably more in line with what I want than what others sports -based want. Sports-based wrestling. Yeah, with wrestling. It's wrestling from the 80s or any time before it where you didn't, where you pretended like everything was real. Treat everything like it's real. All the time. Tony's trying to do it here during a media scrum, but he's ridiculous. <laughs> and he just talks. Bill Watts never did a seven-minute monologue about a tournament. <laughs> he was able to sum it up pretty quickly. Reeser Bowden could do seven minutes on it. Reeser Bowden could say hello for seven minutes. But that's the thing. Sports-based wrestling doesn't just mean like professional grappling. It doesn't just mean, like, the UFC, but in a ring. Isn't that what the, the, these idiot fans that don't know anything about the history of wrestling and just suck at the teat of these fucking children think that we used to do in the old... Well, he wants the 15-minute headlocks. No. No, we don't. And we didn't have... Well, 
Every once in a while, you might have had a 15-minute headlock, and that was either the territory or the town was on its ass or somebody was about to get fucking fired. But otherwise, for fuck's sake, it's so it's so dry, you got to watch it in the rain. Well, I don't know how much more Tony Khan audio I could play, so we're going to stop I don't know here. how much more I can take, so well, look, yeah. Which adult said, put your money where your mouth is, and now that's become his favorite phrase? He saw it on TV, I bet you. All right, well, we'll see if he puts his money where his mouth is with his great sports-based 33-match tournament <laughs> coming up here, Jim. You think everybody's going to be taking notes on their pad that they keep next to their television at home on the results and the points so that they can see who the leaders are and extrapolate and speculate and fornicate on who the winners might be before it happens and get all excited? Because they're all excited. We heard that. Well, you know, in Japan, where it's a very different culture, wrestling was in the daily newspapers and the weekly publications had high circulation so that those fans, when there was a tournament happening, right, you could follow along with who has how many points, who won what match where. Again, they were wrestling a full schedule as opposed to two nights a week, everything being TV. So it's a different thing altogether. And, and again, these tournaments had years and years of, of history of the competitors involved were all main event talents and all known to the public. And the tournament got established to where people knew and understood what was going on. And as you mentioned, Japan is a very different culture. Also, from what I remember uh, when I paid attention, the tournaments always worked out to where that it was a nail biter at the end with two or three different. Uh, contenders having the ability to win with their points the way that they had them or whatever the fuck, how the fuck is Tony going to keep, even if he figures it out ahead of time, then when people start saying, no, I shouldn't do a job here or I, he ought to beat that other guy or whatever, it's going to get all fucked up. And it's going to be one of those old fucking bad territory tournaments where guys were in the second round without having won anything. And other guys got eliminated twice because they couldn't keep their shit straight. Well, we shall see, at least on Wednesdays. I don't know how much uh, we're going to be seeing on Saturdays, but that's Tony Well, Com. We'll wait for the reports in the newspapers. That's Tony Com at the Media Scrum. As you uh, mentioned the other day, MJF was crying at the start of it. We'll see what else happens there. The word is uh, that he may have hurt his hip. And how could he have not? How, I was about to say, how in the, I don't know how he stood back up and walked. Let alone after that is when he did that dive over the rope into the cutter on the floor. Well, yeah, but that, you know, that was on the, uh, no, it was on the same hip, come to think of it, because he was going the opposite direction. So, yeah, he, he landed on his left hip both times. <sighs> well, Jim, let's move on from something you obviously don't like, which is Tony Khan audio, to something you do like, which is you. Me. Uh, you know, we've been uh, doing segments here over the past couple of months on some of the programs, going back 40 years and looking at my schedule for the particular month or the period of time or whatever. And we mentioned here recently that it was starting to get good because I, after I came back from my sojourn to the uh, Georgia territory that they created in the summer of 83, we all got sent back to Memphis, the Memphis Territory, when that folded up, and at the same time, business was big in the summer. Lawler had taken over the book. He was doing, you know, big cards, major matches, blah, blah, blah. But once that it, Lawler had brought in, a, a, we talked about, he booked more guys on the cards than Dundee did when Bill Dundee was booker. And he had brought in all these guys and had 20-something or more in the territory, and then 10 or 12 of us came back from the Georgia thing when the co-promotion with Ole didn't work. So now there's 40 guys in the territory. And so they started running B shows, spot shows. When Louisville would run, there'd also be, you know, Osceola, Arkansas, or opposite Lexington, Kentucky would be Batesville, Mississippi, and, and et cetera. And I was on the the buttermilk run, as the Dream Machine used to say, on all these small towns with, you know, the other guys that Lawler hadn't figured into anything major or just had to serve their penance by going to be in the main event of a shitty show. 
So what happened before then, though? You, the idea that because of the amount of people there, there were all these buttermilk run shows before that period of time where any of these towns run, where they only run, you know, where they run much less, like once every six they, months. How did well, it they, they were some of them weren't run at all. And some of them were only run once a year, but all of a sudden they were getting more often. They had Buddy Wayne out and Eddie Marlin out trying to find towns to keep these guys occupied. And for a couple months, it maybe worked okay, but as you'll see, and as we've talked about, some of them, you know, even if there were only 10 guys on the card or whatever, it was costing the office money. And the summertime was a better time for the Tennessee Territory to draw than the wintertime was in a lot of cases, especially in, you know, the, the small towns where you do a lot of big spot shows in the summer out at the ball field or whatever. So to avoid spending money unnecessarily, which was never a thing Jerry Jarrett was a fan of, as we went into November, which we're about to talk about, they were cutting out a lot of these B-shows. And so therefore I was off a lot more than I had been because I mentioned I was working almost every night and managing four or five, six times a night, just go out with all the heels, just do whatever. Right. But now there's not as many shows to go and do that on. And they're trying to be more fiscally responsible. And that is when the talks started with Jerry Jarrett and Bill Watts, because Watts's territory, mid South wrestling was down and he was, as we mentioned many times, searching, what am I going to do here? I need to change things. And Jerry Jarrett had a fire sale on wrestlers going. Let's get some of these motherfuckers out of here. We got too many mouths to feed. And these, these things were all happening at St. Let me, before we talk about this, let me illustrate something. I want to go to Memphis, Tennessee at the Mid-South Coliseum in November 1982. When Bill Dundee was the booker, I had just started in the business. I'm so going to give you the card. Go ahead. One year earlier. One year earlier. The card for November 15, 1982. First match to main event. Buddy Landell versus Carl Fergie. A coal miner's glove match with the Sheep Herders against Jacques Rougeau and Terry Taylor. Mid-America title match. Dutch Mantell against Jesse Barr with Jim Cornette. A grudge tag team match with Bill Dundee and Bobby Fulton against Coco Ware and Bobby Eaton. A Southern heavyweight title match where they did a stipulation where Lawler was going to defend the title against Jimmy Hart and a mystery partner. And if the, the, the team of Jimmy Hart and his partner won the match, then Hart would become the Southern heavyweight champion, which they milked for a couple weeks, right? And it turned out to be Sabu the Wild Man, who was not Sabu, but that was before Sabu. It was Coco Samoa, who was kind of like, at that time, like a the closest thing in the business to a Jacob Fatu. And they put Sabu over big for a few months in the territory. And so they won. So Hart became the Southern champion. And then the fabulous ones... Uh, wrestled the New York Dolls for the Southern Tag Title versus World Tag Title. And I know a lot of titles here, but there really wasn't a goddamn uh, plethora of them because the New York Dolls had won the WWA World Tag Title that uh, Jared had started recognizing when he started working with Bruiser. And the fabulous ones were the real Southern Tag Team Champions, and the World Tag Team title faded away after the New York Dolls Fabs thing got introduced. Hey, what so was... So, point... Go ahead. What was Rick McGraw like in the back? Um, He was a nice guy. Fun, you know, nice, laughing, friendly. You know, a, a good worker. A strong guy, even though he was short. It was a shame that, you know, he was one of the first guys that, uh, in the modern era, that started having heart attacks. But anyway, the point I was going to make is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 20 guys, including the managers, on the card, right? And that card drew 8,056 people. Now we go ahead one year to November 14, 1983. Lawler is booking. 
and there's uh, there's a lot of talent turnover. Some guys are still there that were there the previous year. But listen to this card. The opening match, eight-man tag team match, grappler Buddy Landell, Carl Fergie, and the Russian Invader, who was bounty hunter Jerry Novak, against Tom Pritchard, the Jaguar, who was Danny Davis, Dutch Mantell, and Robert Reed. Robert Reed was one of Lawler's friends who played softball and did jobs on the TV show. How many of those guys lasted in the 84? Well, hold on. The Moondogs versus U.S. Steel and Plowboy Frazier. U.S. Steel was a guy named, I think his name was Rick Steele, and he was like 350 pounds, and they had broken him in and trained him over the previous six months or whatever, and then Plowboy was... So that was an 800-pound tag team against the Moondogs. Coco Ware and Bobby Eaton against the A-team, who were Roger Smith and Donnie Bass, the ex-assassins, with Jimmy Hart. Bill Dundee versus Tommy Rogers for the U.S. Junior Heavyweight title. The Southern title versus the international title. <laughs> I hate to say this, but Lawler may have had a bit of Tony Khan in him. Austin Idol versus Jesse Ventura. Not guys who like to work cheap. The Southern Tag Team title, the Bruise Brothers, Porkchop Cash and the Dream Machine against the Rock and Roll Express. The World Tag Team title that they had reinstituted. The Fabulous Ones versus Dennis Condry and Norvell Austin. And a handicap boxing and wrestling match with Jerry Lawler versus Jimmy Hart and Andy Kaufman. And eight... 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, including Lawler and Kaufman, 31 guys on the card, and it drew 3,800 people. Wow. That's the difference. Lawler it, it did great during the summer, but he had too many guys that focused. It was... It was a mess at that point. There were too many people to focus on. It was all over the place. And and the, the Kaufman novelty was wearing off. And it, it just, it wasn't working. You said it jokingly, but when you really think about it, there are some similarities in Lawler's booking and what Tony Khan tends to try to do. A and lot of guys and... That's the problem is that, and I'm, you know, everybody knows Love Lawler is a talent and and one of my all-time favorite wrestlers and one of the best ever. But he wasn't the best booker except for his own shit. He innately, naturally knew how to get over and what his opponent should do against him. And Nick Bockwinkle said he was the best match caller he'd ever been in the ring with, blah, blah, blah. But he didn't want to put the work in, and he didn't want to tell anybody no. And he didn't keep fiscal you know, attention on the goddamn cards. He would just, you know, so that's the thing. So they had 13 more guys and drew half the crowd. That's why Jerry Jarrett was stepping back in. And pretty soon they'd, they'd be done with goddamn 15 or 20 of these people. And the main events would be Jerry Lawler and Randy Savage. And they'd be drawn twice the crowd again with, literally a little over half the people on the card. Here's another opening match on December 19th, the Moondogs, Angelo Poffo and Franklin Hayes versus Bobby Eaton, Ricky Morton, the Jaguar and Art Cruz. Followed by a mixed man and midget match, a tag match, <laughs> Dutch Mantel versus Dennis Condry in a loser leave town match. I wonder who won that. The Fabs at Roughhouse Fargo against the A-Team and the Rushed Invader. Les Thornton against Stagger Lee for the World Junior Heavyweight title. And Lawler and Idol against Savage and LeDuc. What do you think of Dennis losing the loser leaves town to Dutch, even though Dennis was leaving? Is that hot shot booking? I mean, was there a feud between Dutch and Dennis Condry that would have needed a blow-off match? Could Dennis have well, just yeah. left without anyone noticing? Well, no. Yes, there was because, you see, on December 5th, <laughs> It had been Dutch and Austin Idol against Dennis Condry and Norvell Austin. And they did a tag match. And then the following week, they were in a 12-man $5,000 challenge match. And then the following... Oh, I'm sorry. And then a grudge match single match also. And then they oh, did okay. the loser leave town. You know, it was a three-week program. But, but point being, 
you know, they, they had to get a lot of these people out of there. And that was a difference in, in how different bookers approached the same thing, but sometimes with different success. But again, I look to January. By the time that Lawler and Savage got going, here's a, a card that drew 78-29. And here's one 77-34. And they still didn't have as, as big a a late winter, early spring, as you would expect, with Savage around because there were some that were bad weather and some that were just down, but they were still doing, you know, five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people a week. And with, here's a, a card from, I'm going to get back to the topic uh, again here in a second. What, November? Yeah, November. <laughs> but here here's a card from April that drew, I'm trying to, because the way this is laid out, I'm trying to make sure I'm getting the right, results on april 2nd here was the card that drew 7500 people scott shannon against jesse ortega oh my god and uh scott shannon was not the the dj i i i don't think although he came from memphis and he knew lawler, he knew lawler you know. yeah god damn maybe it was but he was already on z100 i think maybe by that point well so hopefully know. But Oxbaker ver Oxbaker Oxbaker versus Art Cruz, Dutch Mantel versus Randy Savage, Austin Idol versus Rick Rude, The Fabs versus Norvell Austin and Coco Ware, Handsome Jimmy Valiant versus the Assassin Number One with Paul Jones handcuffed to Jerry Lawler, and then Joe LaDuke and Jimmy Hart against Jerry Lawler and J.J. Dillon. Every match past the first two preliminaries meant something. And there were only six, eight, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 18 guys on the card, 19 if you count the managers. Crockett wasn't really on national TV. What do you think about bringing Paul Jones? The, what they did was the, the angle between Valiant and Jones and the assassin, they sent tape because Jimmy Valiant was such a drawing card in Memphis that they sent tape of an angle that they had done and brought the match to Memphis and called it the Boogie Jam 84, just like they were doing in in the Carolinas for Crockett. And uh, that's what brought the house up to 7,500 people was Jimmy Valiant being on the card. The previous week, I think it was 5,700 and then 5,000. So Jimmy in those days was good for about 2,500 people. Was he always cool with them with money? Like, you know, certain wrestlers may be like, okay, I see I draw a bigger house than your normal crew. I want more money. Was he always cool with them or was there ever an issue? No, he, I think when he got to the point where he knew what he was drawing and they knew what he was worth, that they were, they were cool. He never held them up in terms of the house is bigger tonight because he got paid on the houses. He's, I, and they would give you in those days, like idol and those guys would get a minimum guarantee. But if the house was a sellout and they only got the minimum, there'd be a stink. They knew that. So I think Jimmy was probably taken care. Well, they bought him a house at one time. Well, that doesn't so, count. Well, but I mean, they were taking care of him as best they could realistically. And I don't, I think every once in a while he might, Oh, you know, King, geez, look at the house or whatever. But I don't recall any, any falling outs like uh, Idol had or anything where, you know, Jimmy didn't show up for any other reasons than health or missed planes, which still caused chaos. Anyway, you want to go back to November now and start from scratch. November 1983, 40 years ago, as we speak. On the 1st of November, I started the month in Wilson, Arkansas on a $1,700 house making $50. I believe I mentioned this on the last one we did when we overlapped here. I lost to Tom Pritchard by disqualification in a match and then managed the Bruise Brothers against Bobby Eaton and Dutch Mantell. And for whatever reason, Austin Idol was on this card that didn't draw. And that may have been probably because it was next to Memphis and he was going to fly out the next day. And he beat Buddy Landell. And that was a day. I had been in Memphis the previous day and stayed over and went to Wilson, then 260 miles back to Nashville, and I was off for the next two days because they were starting to cut down on these secondary shows, and there was so many guys. Do you say anything to anyone, even if it's not the office, just any of the wrestlers you talk to, just, are you concerned? 
Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, you know, I'm asking like if I'm riding with Bobby Eaton to the towns or if I'm, you know, in the locker room with any of the guys that, you know, in those shows, there's only five or six other guys in the locker room saying you bored to tears. See, so I'm like, Jesus Christ, can this get any worse? We were all miserable. November 4th was Munfordville, Kentucky. And I got $50. And look who was there with me on what couldn't have been more than a $2,000 house. Buddy Landell beat Ricky Morton. Dutch Mantell beat me and Jimmy Hart. And Ricky and Robert Gibson and Ricky Morton beat Dennis Condry, Norvell Austin, and Buddy Landell. So, you know, it's it, like those guys, I'm still at least lucky to be there and wondering how much longer I'm going to be there. But these guys have been in the business for years and trying to do it seriously, right? And they're like, fucking Munfordville? So it was it was not a a good time for everybody in the territory at that point. And then the the fifth was a Saturday, November fifth, and we were in Nashville because that's when you know after I as a matter of fact you I'm not even TV? I've not written down I didn't go to TV I wasn't on TV so at least I only had to make a thirty mile round trip that Saturday because I made eighty bucks but the other guys had had to go to TV and come back. But would you see that as a bad sign? The fact that you're yes. going to have to go to TV? Yes. Yes. It, it would new, and I would talk to Frank Morell too. Daddy Frank. Right. Because he'd been through the Georgia thing with me too. And he'd been in the business for 20 years at that point. And, you know, he's like, kid, you can only do what you can do. You know, nobody was saying that I was sucking or that it, you know, that I was the shits or I wasn't doing a good job. And there were a lot of other people on this buttermilk run in the same position. It's just there wasn't any room. So, and in Nashville, by the way, Frank Morell, the Angel, beat Bobby Fulton. Dutch beat Norvell Austin by disqualification. Condry Austin and Landell beat the Gibsons and Morton. And then I managed the Assassins against the Fabulous Ones. I'm managing the heels in every single one of these fucking matches. So... That week, I made $255 for working fucking four times. But I, for four days, but I actually worked, what, almost 20 times. And that's the, the only good thing was I was getting the experience, but that was fixing to fucking go. In Memphis on November 7th, I was actually there. The house was $16,000, which was not good. And my payoff was 85 bucks. And but listen to some of these matches. They Lawler was booking these guys. If you took any one of these matches off the card, it wouldn't have affected the house. U.S. Steel over Carl Fergie, the Russian Invader over Bobby Fulton, Dennis Condry and Norvell Austin beat Bobby Eaton and the Jaguar, and Buddy Landell beat Tom Pritchard. I worked all of those. That wasn't the whole card. That wasn't even the fucking main... As a matter of fact, November 7th. Hold on here one second. What was the main event on November 7th that only drew 16 grand? That is what I would like to know. November 7th. Okay. Those that I just mentioned were the first four matches on the card. We also got Bruce Brothers versus Rock and Roll Express, Tommy Rogers versus Bill Dundee, Jesse Ventura versus Coco Ware, Lawler, Idol, and Mantell versus the Moondogs and Man Mountain Link. And the main event, Hair versus Mask, Assassins versus Fabulous Ones. Huh. So, again, we'd lost it. And there was too many guys. So, then on November 8th, Election Day, by the way. When was the, if I could just jump in real quick, when was yes. the first time you heard any whispers that the Fabulous Ones were unhappy? Because they would go to the AWA pretty quickly in 84. Well, I don't know that they were unhappy at that point. I'm trying, no, as a matter of fact, yes, when they came back was when they got a guarantee. They finally, they were unhappy and Vern dangled, you know, that big, the AWA TV was still big at that point, and they didn't know that he wasn't going to understand anything about how to present them, and the run was not going to be anything to speak of, and it was a chance to make a lot more money, even if Memphis was selling out. But then to come back, 
they got $1,500 a week guarantees each from Jarrett, plus, regardless of how many days they worked, few or not, plus uh, they got all their gimmick money, and that was another couple grand a week apiece sometimes, so they were doing quite well. And then, as I mentioned, came November the 8th in Harrisburg, Arkansas. Listen to this. Jerry Lawler and Jesse Ventura was the main event, and it did $3,890, which in those days was what? Four grand at a $5. It was 800 fucking people. Lawler against Ventura. I managed Jesse Ventura. Rock and Roll Express against Condry and Carl Fergie. Norvell didn't make it. Uh, but that's, you know, did Ventura was not work? good. Did Ventura work for the territory? <sighs> Obviously, he has the promo. He's considered a great promo, but... Not really, because the matches were not good. Because the promos were good, but uh, Tennessee had seen every great promo in the world. And at the same time, you had Austin Idol and Jerry Lawler and Stan Hansen at the same time as you have Jesse Ventura, Ventura's promos didn't really stand out. And he was not a great worker, and he didn't have the history here where people had seen him like he had the build in the AWA from when he was years younger. He wasn't necessarily motivated to get hurt coming down and work in Memphis part-time. So, no, it, it, it nobody... If you ask the Tennessee wrestling fans... Jesse Ventura would not be in the top 30 or 40 names they would mention of Lawler's great rivals. But I hate to say that about the governor. Well, you know, not everyone works in every territory they go to. Yeah, and it, it, it didn't work. He, 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 the, the people expected a level of bumps, action, aggression, uh, things that Jesse didn't have in the, in the ring or at least d show with that point. Uh, November 9th, I was off because there was nothing running apparently against Evansville. Princeton, Indiana on Thursday, November 10th. So apparently I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't in fucking Evansville, but I was in the spot show 15 miles from it the next goddamn day. And I'll, I'll save it. I, I was out, uh, eliminated in a battle Royal and managed another five matches for $65. We went to Owensboro on November 11th. And same thing for another $80. And then from Owensboro, I had to drive to fucking Memphis 300 miles to do TV for free the next morning and then head 150 miles back to Parsons, Tennessee for the spot show that night where I made another $65. But listen to who was the main event in Parsons. Lawler and Dutch Mantell beat the Moondogs. And it still didn't draw $2,500. And, you, you know, they, the towns had been played out, the spot shows, and things weren't interesting. So, so then, go ahead. So at the same time where Mid-South Wrestling is having issues where things have slowed down, business has slowed down, the same thing is happening right next door in this territory. For the exact opposite reason. Watts was short on talent. Jared had too much talent. It was it was all lost. There was no focus, and and there were too many titles on the line, and too many short, quick matches, and you know because the 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 Memphis shows when there were forty guys on the card, they still lasted two and a half hours. They started at seven thirty. They were over at ten o'clock. Whether you had five matches or fifteen, and so people were kind of notice it. Just the, the they didn't have the feel of it. And then we come to the time we talked about uh, several shows ago, November 14th in Memphis. That's when Watts came to look at the talent. And that's when Jarrett auditioned me more or less to get rid of me. I managed Condry and Austin to beat the Fabulous Ones for the world tag team title. Uh, and then when the Bruce brothers were wrestling the rock and roll express, the fabs came out to get even with me and gave me the spike pile driver on the concrete floor. And I, I'd also managed the moon dogs against plowboy Frazier and us steel earlier in the night. So I went from doing nothing in Memphis and sometimes not being on the card to when I walked in 
they immediately brought me in the finish room and I'm like, what the fuck? I'm, I'm actually doing something. And that's where Jerry Jarrett was giving the finishes personally that night. And he talked, well, we're going to go back to the old times. We're going to get a long set of heat with the baby face fighting for the tag. We're going to do this and do that. And he was laying it out in more detail than what Lawler had done and, and a lot of times what Dundee had done. But in his more, Dundee was more excitable. I'd blow up watching him act out a finish. Jarrett was very methodical and very professorial about it. Did it relieve any of the talent, the fact that, okay, they realized we got to do something different? A, a number of guys were looking back and forth at Jarrett and, at, you know, just at each other like, okay, you know, it appears like he, because he had not been involved real personally over the, right since I'd been gone before the summertime. But, you know, and and by the way, the house that night in Memphis was $12,300, which was abysmal, less than 3,000 people. And as a matter of fact, you'll, you'll remember that I said that, that that past January, coming off a sellout with Lawler and Bockwinkle the previous week, Christmas week, and then they came back on a Sunday afternoon with me, Adrian Street, and Linda against Bill Dundee and Jerry Calhoun and no Jerry Lawler on the card. And it was the biggest drop in the history of Memphis. It went from 39000 to 11500 This was $800 more than that abysmal house with every goddamn body we had on the card. How come Watts, if he went there scouting talent and he saw what he saw in you, and obviously he saw what he saw in Bobby, and Dennis, but not Norvell. I mean, Norvell would come over later in 84 with the PYTs with Coco, but if he's watching the earlier version of the Midnight Express, Norvell and Dennis, how come that wasn't the team Watts wanted? They weren't being called the Midnight Express then. They had been previously, but they at, when it was all three of them with Randy Rose in Memphis, but they weren't using Midnight Express at that point. That's why Watts asked Dennis well, what kind of name can we call the team? And Dennis said, how about Midnight Express? I don't know otherwise than... <sighs> I like Norvell, but I th Norvell at that point had got real comfortable in Memphis and maybe he didn't work as hard as Watts thought or bump as hard. Or... I mean, being partners with Dennis Condry, at that point, Dennis was one of the, the best workers in the business, heel or babyface. You... You can't get around it in just in terms of his in-ring work, being in the right place, bumping, feeding, being a heel, knowing how to call shit, and all of his shit looked good. He never had a place, never made a mistake. He wasn't going to be the WWF champion or the NWA champion, but he was so good at that. You know, so it was hard being compared to you know, that guy's your partner, Norvell, was Norvell at that point. And then Bobby Eaton's out there, who I'm sure Watts had never seen, probably never heard of, and he's just being Bobby and, you know, blew everybody away. So, you know, and Dennis was a heel. Bobby was a baby face at that point. And I was just floating around. So Watts saw people the way he wanted to use them rather than the way they were presented to him. I guess that's what any good promoter should do. Yes. Any good Espe booker. Especially Booker. Yeah. So, yeah, so I made 80 bucks that night and got a goddamn, got the biggest job of my life. So you actually met Watts that night? No. So you didn't no. meet Watts until you went to the... I was, I was out there working my ass off trying to impress Jerry Jarrett. I didn't really, I think, in hindsight... I think somebody said, hey, that's Bill Watts back there on the babyface side because there were separate sides of babyface and the heels in Memphis. And, you know, I wasn't going to... You didn't go if you were the goddamn ice cream vendor in those days and fucking shake hands with the goddamn president of the company. I wasn't going to go and interrupt Bill Watts in any conversation to introduce myself when he wouldn't give a fuck whether I was alive or dead until he was interested in me. 
But anyway, when when, you, when I first heard this story from you years ago, I had this like vision of Watts sitting like in a second row amongst the fans, like looking at them and watching their reaction. No, no, I know, I know. I wish, I no. wish that was what it was. But there, there was plenty of room for him to come out in the building that night. He didn't come all the way to ringside, but he didn't get accosted by a lot of the fans back in the cheap seats. And that's when uh, Tuesday and Wednesday was the normal days for Louisville and Evansville, and there was no secondary town running, so I was off both those days. I just went back to Nashville. And that's why we were in Liberty, Kentucky on November 17th, and that's when Dennis came up to me and said, I need to talk to you. And you know, Dennis had that face. I'm always, oh, you need to talk. What did I do? And he calls me out of the locker room. We were at this little dingy, I think it might even have been a middle school gym. And I remember these locker rooms were dark and small. And he called me where the boys, the other boys weren't because, you know, I don't think anybody knew about this. I didn't know. So I guess the other guys didn't. And he said to me, he said, Bill Watts wants to bring me and Bobby in as a team and you to manage us into his territory. And I kind of chuckled because I'm, and I'm, I'm looking for him to laugh. And Dennis didn't laugh that much, you know, and things like that. But I'm waiting for him to laugh, and I'm thinking, why is Dennis ribbing me like this? Right? I can barely get booked in goddamn Liberty. And he's, I said, no. And he said, no. I'm serious. <laughs> What's going to bring me and Bobby in as a team, and you as our manager? And he says we're going to make between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars a piece next year. And I mean, while I'm in Liberty, Kentucky, the house was $1,300. Even at the ticket prices in those days, $5 average, what's that? Goddamn 250 people. I'm going to make $50. And I've been doing absolutely fuck all of nothing except going out on spot shows and killing myself, working out. And I'm thinking, what? how can this be? And he assured me that he was serious and he said i i can't remember if i if he said call the office tomorrow or they're going to call you we're going to get plane tickets we're going next week to do television i'm what the fuck plane tickets these motherfuckers i've been working for these fuckers for a year they haven't even offered to buy me a tank of gas to go to water valley mississippi i'm getting a fucking plane ticket so so yeah, that was kind of uh, bizarre. And then uh, the rest of that week, we were in Glasgow, Kentucky. The next night, nineteen hundred dollars. I I made fifty bucks. Four more matches. Then Bowling Green. I made fifty dollars on Saturday night. I was off on Sunday. And then they booked me in Memphis on November twenty first. And when I got there, I was wearing a neck brace that they didn't tell me to to wear, but as soon as, you know, we had one. I think I already had one from an angle we'd done previously, but I got spike pile driven. So the people up north didn't know about it that week, but the next week I come into Memphis, I'm wearing a neck brace, and that's when they realize, well, shit, no sense in you going out, you're hurt. Right? I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> and I hadn't made TV that weekend, so people may have thought I was dead, right? And that house was only like 11 or 12 grand. They gave me a $70 payoff for just coming down and sitting there. But, and then Brian, November 22nd and November 23rd, look at the difference here. On November 22nd, I was in Katie's, Kentucky. The house was $963. That wasn't even 200 people. I made $50. I managed Buddy Landell over Bobby Eaton, the grappler Lynn Denton over the Jaguar, who I mentioned was Danny Davis, and I managed the Bruise Brothers, and they got beat by the Rock and Roll Express and went back to fucking Nashville, and the next day we went to the airport and flew to Shreveport, Louisiana, and I became the lead heel manager of Mid-South Wrestling. <laughs> and... I got paid. We He paid us, even though you in those days, I've mentioned this before, the goddamn regular stars and the talent 
in a territory didn't get paid for television or only got a nominal fee, right? Like Crockett gave you $40. You didn't get paid for Memphis TV at all because you were the stars. That's what got you over. They'd pay the job guys. Well, Watts paid all three of us to $100 a piece for making the TV plus bought our plane tickets. So all we were out was $25 at the Alamo Plaza and 15 bucks for a nice dinner. And that was the biggest payoff I'd had in fucking three months. And yeah, they sent the plane tickets, which came and, you know, we left Nashville and at Shreveport at the airport. And I'm thinking, what the fuck is this plane is taken off. I'm like, my God, they're flying me somewhere to do this on purpose. And we get to Shreveport. He sent Grizzly Smith to pick us up. And we had no earthly idea about anything about Grizzly Smith at that point, otherwise than I being a wrestling historian knew he was one of the Kentuckians and Dennis being the smartest one of us to the wrestling business knew that he was Bill Watts's number one stooge. And we better watch what we say and what we do and be exemplary employees. And he carted us over to the Alamo Plaza, which was the shittiest hotel that I have regularly stayed at in my entire life. And you had to get the, we found out you had to get the building on the left rather than the one on the right if you didn't want the bugs. And they, they, the guys got a $25 a night rate, however many people you want to put in the room, whatever. And then he took us to the, the fairgrounds there, the Irish McNeil Boys Club. And we saw how this TV was done, and everybody's seen the Mid-South footage from the Irish McNeil, but they had a great crowd in those bleachers, so it looked good. It was a basketball rec center type gym, so they didn't use all of it, but what they did use, they shot well with, what was it, two camera plus something on the announcers. Cheap to produce. The people came every two weeks, and that TV show even though Memphis TV, the ratings were so strong, then it went to Louisville, it went to Nashville, to Evansville, to Lexington, and, you know, we had the auxiliary small TVs in Tupelo, Mississippi, and Jackson, Tennessee. This fucking TV was playing in New Orleans, in Houston, in Oklahoma City, in Tulsa, in Jackson, Mississippi, Little Rock, Arkansas, every major market and minor in the state of Louisiana, Biloxi, Mississippi. I was seen then by more people than had ever seen me before in my brief time in the wrestling business just by being on that TV one week. Who was the first person you heard from that saw you on TV that couldn't believe it? Someone who knew you from the WFIA? Now, outside of Memphis, obviously, in Mid-South. Oh, God. Um, well, no, anybody I knew from the WFIA, they, would have, they wouldn't have been, like, gobsmacked because they knew I was in the business. And I'm trying to think, Hildebrand was out of his mind. I remember that. He was like, oh, that's great. Um, Brian Hildebrand, I should say, a referee Mark Curtis to the uninitiated. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I had never even really, when I think about it, besides, I, I instantly kind of knew Bruce Pritchard because I'd been working with Tom. And so when we started going to Houston, you know, that's where my, Long relationship with Brother Brucey began, but I'd never even really had a lot of pen pals or contacts in that territory. Randy Hales is the one who had gotten me most of the Mid-South TV tapes um, on VHS or Beta because he lived in Jonesboro. He was close enough where he could get the Little Rock TV. Um, but anyway, never... Oh, and by the way, our two first matches... The very first match we had as a team, we beat Mike Jackson, who is still wrestling today at 75. It's the same one. And his partner was Rick Rude, the same one. He his was original Rick, spelling. R-O-O-D, greener than a pepper tree, as Frank Spaceman Hickey would say. And then we did, because there were two tapes done that night. The second match, we beat uh, Josh Stroud, who was this really good-looking bodybuilder kid that you know, worked for a couple of years, never really made it. And Lanny Poffo was his partner because Lanny was 
fixed to finish up and head to Memphis. What was that like for you, working with Lanny after all the heat for so many years? Not that you were in the middle of it, well, but you knew of it. Well, yeah, it, it was bizarre in that, you know, I was only a photographer when it was the ICW and Jarrett war. So, but still just to be on the opposite side of a, of a member of ICW after all that was strange, but it, it, thank, thankfully he was there because Josh was green at that point And it wouldn't have been pretty if we hadn't had Lanny. Who told you guys no top rope or did you know? Uh, it, no, it was, it was, I'm sure it was reinforced to us, but see, there was no top rope in Memphis either. See, remember, that's the thing is a lot of people haven't noticed when Bobby was starting to do the finishes off the ropes in Mid-South, he was coming off the second rope because off the top rope was an automatic disqualification as it had been in Tennessee since the dawn of time. So we had no problem adapting because that had been the conditions we were working under. And where Bobby got to open up off the top rope, really, you could do it in Dallas, in world class. It was not illegal, but he didn't very much because the rings were harder than Chinese arithmetic, and he'd have killed himself. But then Crockett, by that point, had no top rope rule, and when we got on TBS, it's Bobby have at it. Anyway, so the next day was Thanksgiving, and we went back to Nashville and ate Thanksgiving dinner at Bill Dundee's house. And boy, howdy, Jamie was only like eight years old then. So he was a fun kid to be around. And then, okay, now, again, I've just been to Mid-South Wrestling where they have announced to the goddamn locker room, the Midnight Express are coming in. They're the new top heel team. And here's Jim Cornette. He's their manager. And we're going to push these motherfuckers to the moon. On the Friday of Thanksgiving weekend, I was in Springfield, Tennessee in front of it looks like by the house, 150 people, uh, me and Jimmy Hart getting beaten up by Bobby Eaton. And then after Springfield, which is Tracy Smothers' hometown, right up northeast of Nashville, I had to go 225 miles down to Memphis to do TV the next morning because I came out, I remember this, I came out with the neck brace and my arm in a sling. It just went, Ooh behind jimmy doing the promo because i was still hurt and that was what i did for it was a 450 mile round trip to stand there in a neck brace and go Arr! and then go to jonesboro that night and even hurt coco Ware beat me and jimmy hart in a handicap match i got 75 bucks and went 285 miles back to nashville so from the time i left springfield tennessee at 10 o'clock on friday night i drove 570 miles and did a free TV taping and got beat up in a handicap match. When were you told that Dundee was going to be the booker? That you and I have tried to pinpoint that and narrow it down in the past because of some retrospectives we had done on Mid-South and other things. Did you know when you went to Thanksgiving dinner? You know, I think, I think so. But even though I don't remember him being at the first taping that we were at, I don't remember him being there until the second taping we went to. So, I'm, you know, it might just, well, also remember Bobby was married to Donna at that point. So, you know, and they knew I was sitting there in fucking Nashville twiddling my thumbs. So it could have just been a charitable a charitable in invitation, but he also could have been wanting to make sure he got on all the fucking boys on his good side before he took the book. Was it this year or the previous year where he told Bobby that he had to come over to the house and jerk off the dog or whatever the story was? No, that, that was, no, that was w when Dundee took his first trip down, which probably was in front of the, the next taping that we went. Dundee went down and spent three or four days with Watts in Oklahoma and to talk about the the plans. And that was when Dundee had this, I don't know if it was a pit bull or a Rottweiler or whatever, big old badass looking dog. And he told Bobby he needed Bobby to come over and take care of it. Bobby said, okay, he thought like feed, water, whatever. And then Dundee, because he knows that Bobby is scared of big dogs anyway. He's got a weak stomach. He's scared of big dogs. He had all the phobias, right? And so Dundee compounds it 
by fucking telling him, now, you know, mate, if you don't take care of him every couple of days, he's going to get mean. He'll bite your ass. What do you mean take care? Well, you've got to jack him off. Keep him happy. What? He had Bobby convinced he was going to have to go over and jack that fucking dog off every two days or every time he tried to feed the dog, the dog would eat his ass. Fortunately, it didn't come to where he actually, he didn't milk it all the way. I think he, Bobby just finally said no, and he, well, he started laughing anyway. But there you go, and I was off the rest of the fucking month of November. I was off the 27th, I was off the 28th, I was off the 29th, I was off the 30th. And by the way, December 1st, I was in Lexington, Kentucky. For whatever reason, out of was Jimmy Hart sick, I was there with Condry and Austin when they lost to the fabulous ones. And then I was off for another fucking four days in a row. And then we'll talk about this as we get into more of the Mid-South run, but I made a few more Tennessee appearances. Basically, when, when I was in Nashville and Jimmy didn't want to be, or because I was in Louisville and Jimmy didn't want to be. And, you know, otherwise than that, they were glad to be rid of me and couldn't wait for the time where I would be in Tennessee or in Louisiana full time. Although, although, I've got to say this, the two-week program that I am most proud of of my rookie year, December 10th and December 17th, I was in Nashville, Tennessee. And since I was the one to manage all the heels, I managed the fabulous or managed the Bruise Brothers in a cage match against the fabulous ones in the main event on the 10th and then came back and on the 17th, I was at a six-man cage match, me and the Bruise Brothers against the Fabulous Ones and Rough House Fargo. I wrestled Rough House Fargo. Wow. And that was... The, and I was scared shitless because they try, started ribbing me that Rough House was going to blade me whether I liked it or not. And then as soon as I got in the ring with him, he grabbed me in a headlock and took his thumbnail and started running across my head and said, watch the blade, kid. I'm like, oh, shit, I got to make TV in Mid-South. <laughs> And, but then he headbutted me and God damn, I'd rather he'd have cut me. It was, it was a stiffest old prick. God damn. He'd kill you. He touched you. It hurt. What did you but, say to your mom and when? Um, as soon as I was certain that Dennis wasn't ribbing me, I don't know whether I told her until I got the, either called the office or got the phone call from the office. But then I told her, I said, guess what? And she didn't know who Bill Watts was, but as the promoter in Louisiana wants to bring us down and give us the top spot. And I'm going to be moving to Louisiana. And obviously she was like, oh boy, because she knew the, you know, the level of business that I was involved in at that point and that I was not setting the world on fire. And, and so she was trepidatious, but as I convinced her that it was a significant step up, and then she, well, just be careful. And thank God she wouldn't go into the matches at that point where she'd talk to any of the boys about the Louisiana Territory, and they all universally said, my God, they'll kill Cornette in three weeks. Because that probably would have not made her very happy. But um, Did you have any kind of, like, final conversation? I mean, it sounds so silly saying it like that, but thank you, Jerry Jarrett. You know, hopefully I'll see you again down the road. Or Did you have any goodbyes with any of the people that you'd seen since the beginning of your wrestling career and well, you knew with, you were leaving. With with Jerry Jarrett, no, because I actually never saw him. I never saw he never booked me back in Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> and and he wasn't coming to he went to Memphis and he went to TV. And sometimes he wasn't going to TV. And so, you know, but I mean he I'm sure he figured, well, Cornette's happy and I'm rid of him. And along with these other guys that I couldn't fucking pay. But we <laughs> I, I said goodbye to all the people that I was in the locker room with, you know, sparingly over the last few weeks that I was there. But again, it, back in those days, the wrestling business, you didn't have glorious goodbyes unless you were really close personal friends and it was all planned because sometimes guys just left and you didn't see them before they, they went. Um, but it's a little but different we, with you just because, again, yeah. you're a little more sentimental. You started as a fan. You've been with this company. Yes, this well, and, and I definite, definitely did say goodbye to Teeny. Because the last time I was in Louisville was what uh, was... I was in Louisville on December the 6th. 
And I knew, and I figured I probably wasn't going to be back again. So, you know, and, and she was excited about it because, you know, she knew what it was like for guys to start in the wrestling business and then go to a bigger territory and get a better spot or whatever. And I, you know, I'm sure she was, you know, sad to see me go, but it was better than me. She wasn't seeing me and I was working there. I was in fucking Batesville, right? She wasn't seeing me to begin with. And, 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 and one more thing I will say that we wanted to call Jerry Jarrett because we really did. Dennis, Bobby, myself, Ricky, Robert Dundee. Remember Dundee had come back from Georgia and he couldn't even, he'd lost a loser leave town. He couldn't even get back in the big towns right away. He'd been on this buttermilk run long about March or April in mid South. We started doing the joke. Hey, Bill, can you call Jerry Jarrett and tell him, send down some bigger buildings? Because his rejects are selling these son of a bitches out, as Ricky would say, and they're bigger than the ones he's got. That is something, isn't it? So anyway, and yeah, and, and basically in the month of December, we made another TV taping. We uh, went to Shreveport again on December the 7th and did three TVs, which were to propel us through the holiday time. And we beat Mike Jackson and Coco Ware. Uh, Mike Jackson and somebody who, who I didn't record the name and Randy Barber and somebody who I didn't record the name because they were the local guys and I was verklempt and couldn't remember it. But that that carried us through till Christmas Day. We started full time in New Orleans and we'll cover that sometime in December. I have you guys against George Weingroff and John King and Doug. Uh, no, that's not your match. And then also George Weingroff and Randy Barber. Okay, it was Weingaroff and Randy Barber. Well, then why does Oh, okay, I got Jackson twice. Sorry about that. And I remember John King. I remember him because that was actually the name of my grandfather on my mother's side. And suddenly we're beating him up. Some interesting guys in the locker room when you first arrive in Mid-South. Tom Lintz, who had a short little thing on TV that went nowhere, but he was there. Magnum TA, well, you weren't really in the babyface locker room, so you wouldn't have seen Magnum TA. Well, we, we, in Shreveport, everybody was together. And there are a few of the towns, everybody was together. So I did meet all these people for the first time. And Tom, Tom Lynch was Boomer Lynch at one point. He was a, just a gregarious fella, but didn't, didn't go very far. And Magnum was a nice guy, but boy, he was... He was green, that being our first program, him and wrestling too. It was like the most experienced guy in the in the territory and the greenest. And, well, and, no, not the greenest. What did you think of early Dr. Death when you first met him? Oh, boy, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Doc, and again, you know, Doc was a great guy to hang out in a locker room with, but Bobby and Dennis and I were all looking around. Here is Nikolai Volkov, six foot three, 320, ex-boxer, fucking Crusher Darso, goddamn 300 pounds. He's a fucking bouncer friend of the road warriors there's goddamn ernie ladd is 6'9 325 when he cracks his knuckles it sounds like breaking a broomstick here's uh, dr death steve williams four-time all-american football and wrestling 285 pounds stiff as a goddamn board and brand new hacksaw duggan played pro football we're looking at ourselves and go what the fuck are we gonna do in this territory and that was bump. the key bump <laughs> exactly take bumps and and get heat and move and that's what it needed the rock and roll in the midnight and then terry taylor and magnum kept coming along they started people moving in the ring and they started drawing the women and they started the, the music matches videos were, the music videos mtv updated the fucking style a little bit and it was still Watts's vision of wrestling. It was, it was all legitimate, logical. It was treated as a sport. Nothing was allowed to get out of out of hand to be completely unrealistic, except for junkyard dad, junkyard dog in the locker room. There's another guy. He was jacked at that point. And but it was with younger, better looking, faster, more exciting, different personalities than what they'd seen. I was completely the opposite of Skandor Akbar, who had been the hottest manager in the territory up until that point. You couldn't get any more different than me and Ak. 
just because that we were completely different people and different gimmicks. But it it registered with everybody, and the booking was taken up a step because, you know, let's face it, Watts had an intricate mind, and he was a fantastic booker, but the guys that he hired, whether it be the Buck Robleys or the Ernie Lads, had learned in completely different places, in a completely different generation, whereas Dundee was younger and had all those Tennessee ideas that they had been done so long and so often in Tennessee that they were just done by the numbers and they weren't explained and they weren't, the most wasn't made out of it. The, the blindfold battle Royal where 18 guys are blindfolded and thrown in the ring and the last man gets fucking $10,000. That was a spot show match in Tennessee because it'd been done to death and people had seen it over the years. Watts said, wait a minute, what is this? <laughs> I can make this sound like it more dangerous than goddamn nuclear fallout. And for a two-week period, he main evented the towns with that match, saying, imagine what it's going to be like when 20 guys that are blind and weigh 250 pounds apiece have to throw each other over the top rope to win this money. And it drew. That was the, it was just, it was a change in talent and presentation it, with, without a change in philosophy or the rules of the game. And he went from a bad year to the biggest year he ever had in business. And you went from a bad <laughs> year to the biggest year you've ever had in a business as well yes. in 1984. And, well, and that's, I mean, that's like being the nicest guy in prison. Of The biggest year I'd had of all two and a half of them. But because of that, that's, you know, when... When the people heard about, well, there's this fucking guy named Junkyard Dog. If people in the wrestling business I'm talking about, in the business, promoters, talent. Guy named Junkyard Dog, who the fuck's he? I don't know, but he just drew 30,000 people in the Superdome. Maybe we better book his ass. Same thing happened. Who's Jim Cornette in the Midnight Express? I don't know, but they just drew 25,000 people in the Superdome. Maybe we ought to look at them. That made us, from the, we left there, we could go anywhere. <laughs> we wanted to go to the Carolinas. We got sidetracked to Dallas for six months. We told that story. Then we went to the Carolinas. And by that point, that was the biggest company that we could go to that wasn't the WWF. And anything else would have been a step backwards, so we never left. You said, we'll work anywhere. And they sent you to Dallas. And you said, we meant anywhere else. Anywhere else. Well, they, they, and see, that's the thing. They never told us till we already, they, they just said, you're finishing. Okay, well, we got a place that has already invited us. So we made that deal. And then, oh, but we want you to go to Dallas so we can keep bringing you back. Eh, these planes fly all, all over the country. But we didn't feel like exerting the authority that we may have had at that point because it, it would have been against the, the guys that were responsible for us being in demand, Bill Watts and Bill Dundee. So we went to Dallas. And we'll get there in a year or so, a little year and a half. <laughs> in a year and a half or so, I guess we'll get there. I Dallas. don't, you know, but if we're looking at doing my next 10 years month by month, we better speed up a little bit. I might not, not make it to the end of my final years. Oh, you got to make it to the herd review after all these years. When we finally get to the herd years. All right. We have heard enough. Have you heard enough, Brian? You know what? This is a special uh, holiday theme drive through because I don't know when you're hearing it, but we're recording it the day before Thanksgiving and uh, post office closes soon. So that is all for this week. We'll be back with more. What else you got to say? Absolutely nothing. Well, that's it then. Happy Thanksgiving which already happened. We'll talk to you on the experience. For Jim uh, Cornette, uh, uh, for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho! Uh.